I'm Shauna Smith alongside Brad Smith. This is Yahoo Finance's flagship show, The Morning Brief, the ultimate guide to help you, the investor, make smarter decisions for your portfolio. We're tracking early session volume while bringing you today's top market themes and elevating Yahoo Finance's most popular newsletter. Happy hump day or Wednesday, whatever you're calling it at home. Call stock futures mixed this morning as investors brace for the Federal Reserve's policy decision. That's at 2 p.m. Eastern time. Central bank officials will signal whether they still believe three interest rate cuts are likely in 2024. Another big headline that we're watching, the Biden administration awarding Intel $8.5 billion to fund chip plants across four states. So let's get right to it. The three things that you need to know your roadmap for the trading day. Yahoo Finance's Jennifer Schaumberger, Josh Schaefer, and Josh Lipton have more. The Federal Reserve widely expected to hold interest rates steady this afternoon in the range of five and a quarter to five and a half percent. But the major question on the table is whether Fed officials still see three rate cuts this year or whether that could be scaled back in light of hotter than expected inflation data in the first two months of this year. The other major question on the table, when could the Fed begin lowering rates? Is June still in play or could that be pushed back? Bitcoin regaining some losses after a big pullback. The price of Bitcoin hovering just around 64,000 after shedding more than $210 billion in value since its record high last week. That's according to data over at CoinMarketCap. And the entire cryptocurrency market has been tracking losses around $400 billion in market cap. And a milestone moment for Intel. The White House agreed to provide Intel with up to $8.5 billion in funding through the CHIPS Act. Chip makers saying the infusion of cash will eventually fund sites at locations, including that massive complex building in Ohio, plants in Arizona and New Mexico, and its research and development facility in Oregon. CEO Pat Gelsinger calling the federal grant a, quote, defining moment for Intel in the next great chapter of American semiconductor innovation. Less than 30 minutes until the start of trade. Today's top story, the Federal Reserve announces its latest policy decision Tuesday, well, excuse me, 2 p.m. Eastern time today here with what investors should be looking out for is our very own Jennifer Schoenberger. Jennifer, yeah, that Tuesday and two day uh, really sneaks up on a lot of people out there. But it is Wednesday. And as you said, Brad, it is hump day. It's Wednesday, right? Yes, exactly. We, we've made it halfway here. We made it halfway. Congratulations. Well, as you said, the Federal Reserve convening just moments ago here in Washington for the second day of their two day policy meeting where they're widely expected to hold rates steady in the range of five and a quarter to five and a half percent. Here are three things you need to watch for the meeting this afternoon. Number one. The main focus will be whether the Fed still sees three rate cuts this year or whether officials have scaled back cuts on hotter inflation data in the first two months of this year. It only takes two officials to put down two rate cuts this year for the median to shift to two cuts from three. While the first two months of this year did see hotter inflation data, if officials don't think that the latest inflation readings change the overall picture that much, it might argue for leaving estimates where they are. Officials did warn it would be, quote, bumpy and guided on taking a cautious approach given the risk of hotter data, which has shown true. So these bumps in the road may already be built into their previous forecast. Number two, investors will also look for clues from Fed Chair Powell's press conference on whether the first rate cut is still possible in June, as markets are pricing in, or whether that timing could be pushed back. And number three, officials are discussing how to eventually stop the ongoing runoff of the Fed's balance sheet or quantitative tightening. Will Chair Powell offer any insight into what officials discussed? That decision coming down at 2 p.m. Eastern here in Washington. Guys. All right, Jen, thanks so much. And of course, we will uh, be following you for the latest on that. I know you're going to be joining the show right at 2 p.m. Eastern time with that decision. All right, well, futures this morning are flat ahead of the Fed's decision this afternoon. One of the big focal points in this afternoon will be the dot plot and whether or not central bankers still see three cu rate cuts before the end of the year. We want to bring in Omar Aguilar. He's Schwab Asset Management's CEO and Chief Investment Officer. Omar, it's great to see you here. So my question to you is, we have been talking so much about the dot plot right now and what it signals. The last issue we got, uh, central banks, uh, central bankers saw three cuts before the end of the year. How much does that matter to the equity movement that we'll likely see in reaction to the dot plot? 
Well, you know, good morning. Yeah, normally, you know, with CFED days, you know, we tend to see a lot of volatility going into um, the close to the announcement around, you know, you know, 2 p.m. and uh, you know today, and you know after after they make the decision and after they make the announcement, a lot of the focus is really just on the language of what the Fed might signal. I think uh, you know, looking at the potential is signal of whether or not the market believes that June will be the starting point. And today, you know, right now, as you actually look at Fed fund futures, you know, roughly it's a 50-50. It's still, uh, you know, up in the air, and that may trigger that equity market volatility and yield volatility in the bond market as well as you know, people will try to extrapolate any words that signal that the Fed is sort of uh, either pushing higher and faster for the beginning of the rate increases, or they will potentially push, you know, for further out. Um, you know, the data dependent language will still be there. The patient language will still be there. And I think it's just any signals that will suggest that they're looking at other pieces of data. You know, Omar, as you put within your notes to us as well here, historically, central banks, they don't have a tendency to cut rates ahead of economic deceleration here. So why is the case different this time, potentially? Well, you know, the the historical high levels of inflation that the Fed has been, you know, looking to um, reduce is so, certainly a very different path of what we had. And a lot of that obviously is related to the pandemic we had in 2020 and the supply chain disruptions that we had. So I think the uh, the big trade-offs that the Fed is and other central banks are trying to do is, you know, is the sticky inflation so hard and therefore we need to be more patient and try to keep these high levels of rates for a little longer or do we think that there is a risk that we're going to push the economy into recession? So far, you know, the economy seems to be incredibly resilient, and a lot of the inflation data seems to point out that it's all coming from the services sector. Now, when that what that means is that that supply chain disruption that we saw back in 2020 and in 2021, you know, has completely gone away, and therefore, what is left is that service section inflation that the Fed continues to, um, you know, be restrictive about. Now, what is what is the big trade-off is whether or not that real Fed fund rates that is very high right now, it's something that potentially have an impact on GDP growth. Omar, when we, when we talk about the calculus right now about the risk of a recession, there was a Bank of America uh, survey out earlier this week talking about the fact that not as many people are anticipating that we will see a recession. If, in fact, we do see the Fed, though, reduce the dot plot to, to only two cuts before the end of the year, how much will we see that risk rise here for a recession? Do you see it making a material difference? Well, the, there is a there is a clear um, signal in in many cases that the Fed tends to be late to any decisions, and in this particular case, the Federal Reserve seems to be incredibly data dependent and goes data by data. Um, you know, the the big part of this it comes down to both consumers and labor market. You know, to the extent that the labor market stays where you are, stays strong with so, levels of wage inflation or wage growth that is you know consistent with U.S. economic growth. I think the Fed will continue to just push that and the uh, um, probability of our recession may be low. However, if we start seeing like a pickup in, in, in potential um, inflation numbers, mostly through services, whether it's through wage growth or whether it's just consumption, you know, a big part of what it may happen is that the Fed will probably need to be faster in terms of cutting rates, which we will probably be a signal of, uh, of our recession. And remember, in many cases, the Fed tends to just go faster in re reducing rates when, when recession is almost here or it's already at the time of the recession, meaning in many cases they're late. Um, so in this particular case, one data point that is important to, to point out here is that we have seen an increasing in productivity, which is great because that's usually not inflationary and tends to actually support economic growth. And so at this point, Omar, what is the what is the strategy play that you would implore to many investors out there? I mean, there, there's some crowded spots in this market right now, whether it's long tech or whether it's kind of short China equities or for some out there, it's long Bitcoin. Where are you telling clients and, and where are you identifying some opportunities outside of the most crowded trades? 
Well, you know, we when we look at everything we just discussed uh, about the, the monetary policy cycle, when you see where the economic um, cycle is going, we clearly have all signs that we're on the last phase of the economic cycle. I think the bigger question that we continue to um, try to get a sense from the market and from central bank officials is whether or not we're going to get into the soft landing. And I'd probably say Fed officials are in that particular task of trying to just hit that um you know, soft landing that we all, you know, been looking for. Yes, the the word of the recession and the risk of the recession was is much lower now than it was, you know, even a year ago. Uh, but overall, what we're going to continue to encourage our investors is to think about this as an opportunity to position themselves and position their strategies for the next part of the cycle, which is when the economy recovers. And what that means is, you know, continue to position yourselves away from, you know, the the typical, you know, sectors and areas that do well through the recession or through the soft landing and then position part of their portfolio towards the recovery. And that means cyclical sectors, that means going into energy, going into materials, going into financials and areas like small cap where you can actually see they're lagging from the mega caps uh, as they probably do well whenever the, um, the, the economic recovery starts in that next phase. Omar Aguilar, who is the Schraub Asset Management CEO and CIO. Thank you so much for taking the time this morning. Alrighty. We're also tracking Bitcoin this morning. Bitcoin recovering uh, some of its earlier losses, hovering around $64,000, just shy of that this morning after logging its worst single day drop since the FTX collapse, according to Yahoo Finance data. Now, the cryptocurrency falling from all time highs. It just hit last week. Joining us now, we've got Owen Lau, who is the Oppenheimer Executive Director and Senior Analyst. Owen, for this dip, should investors be buying in, uh, or should they be a little bit wary of what's taking place? Yeah, good morning. Thank you for having me. So I think the the, the reason for this correction are a couple of things, right? Number one, Bitcoin was up 150% in 2023. It's up 50% year to day. And then if you look at the recent strength in, this, uh, in, in Bitcoin, a lot of, I think a big part of that is tied to the recent strength in the spot, the net inflows into the net spot Bitcoin ETF. And we started to see some net outflows from this product. And finally, and what you just talked about was the um, inflation data was hotter than expected. And we are actually looking to see whether the Fed would cut uh, three times this year. So what I would say is maybe investors can be a little bit more patient and wait for a little bit for this correction. When we talk about the downside risk here, Owen, how big of a drop are you expecting? We're right above 63,000 today. Could we drop below 60,000? Yeah, it, it, it is possible, but I think it's, again, this is data dependent. So what we just start to see was the kind of the bigger outflows from this product. I think uh, yesterday we saw $600 million outflow from all these products, uh, mainly driven by Grayscale. And then um, the Fed decision today is pretty important as well. If the Fed decided to, hey, let's just cut two rates, I think there will be further room to drop for, for, for Bitcoin. So I think right now we, we're just like data dependent and it's possible that it can dip further. You know, it, it's really interesting as we think about the number of ETFs that have really boomed the inflow into crypto in, in general here now, when it comes to where we might see rotation or profit taking along the way, what type of shocks should holders of Bitcoin or, or crypto more broadly be ready for or prepared for? I think if you look at the history of Bitcoin volatility, it has been one of the most volatile assets. So I think for new investors coming into this space, if they don't know about the history of Bitcoin, just go back and check about the history expect volatility in investing in this asset class. So this is a high beta technology company. If you want to like use the equities as, as an analogy, uh, some people use that as a digital gold. But in any way, if you look at the history, Bitcoin ha it has been very volatile. So expect volatility going forward. Ellen, oh, going back to what you were saying earlier, just in regards to the sentiment shift that we have seen, do you think it's warranted at this point, given the fact that there is many reasons, like you have laid out in recent research notes, to be optimistic about the price in the long term? Yeah, I think over the long term, uh, I, we are still optimistic because of a couple of reasons. Number one, we still see further adoption for spot Bitcoin ETF. 
we are just still in the early innings. And remember, Bitcoin is a global phenomenon. So I think uh, BlackRock listed in uh, US and they are just uh, going to list or they just listed IBIT, um, their spot Bitcoin ETF in Brazil. So you can tell uh, many of these asset managers can list this product overseas. So, and this product is homogeneous. Like you, you can also buy Bitcoin in Asia, in Singapore, and also in, in Europe. They're the same. And the second point is uh, right now, I think the headwinds we are seeing, um, part of that came from, probably came from the Fed. So if the Fed decided to, okay, let's cut more rate next year, we still see the case and catalyst that that can support the Bitcoin price longer term. So I would say longer term, we are still optimistic about the Bitcoin price action. Oh, and just lastly, while we have you, uh, I was looking at one of the blog posts, uh, blog posts from Coinbase CEO, Brian Armstrong posted yesterday where he talks about some of the features moving forward, popular examples, digitizing the dollar, fast, cheap global payments, business model for creatives, decentralized social media under the umbrella of this title. What is crypto good for anyway? Who are, and, and of course, Coinbase has a lot to gain by this, but at the end of the day, who are some of the biggest crypto touching equity market plays that you've got your eye on that could uh, continue to see a sustained inflow or sustained positive reaction as a result of a lot of the new highs we've seen this year in crypto? Yeah, thank you for pointing out this point. I think there is a misunderstanding about digital assets have no use cases. And Brian was so right that point out some of the actual use cases in this space. Um, right now, the largest one obviously is Coinbase. And there are some private companies that I don't want to comment at this point that could potentially disrupt the whole payment space and remittance space and, and, and for longer term. So I do think tokenization is one of the use cases remittance and global uh, money transfer, it's another big use case for digital assets. So I would say at current you know, landscape, I am still uh, pretty positive on Coinbase that can capitalize this opportunity. But longer term, you'll see more private companies going into public market and we, we can talk more about that. Oh, and you gotta give us one. Give us one private market company that you've got your eye on, <laughs> that you can't wait to make a public debut. <laughs> I'll tell you in, in 12 months. In 12 months. Okay. All right. I'm going to set my calendar or my kitchen timer. Owen, thanks so much. Appreciate the time. Owen Lau, who is the Oppenheimer Executive Director and Senior Analyst. Thanks so much. Thanks. Well, the U.S. will award Intel with up to nearly $20 billion for chip manufacturing as part of the Chips and Sciences Act that breaks down to up to $8.5 billion in grants and $11 billion in loans in what Commerce Secretary Gina Raimondo says will be the single biggest announcement of a grant to any CHIPS recipient. Now, shares of the chip maker are jumping on the news. You're taking a look at Intel shares, INTC, up by about 2.4% here pre-market. Uh, two of the highlights from this that Intel pointed out, they're expecting a benefit from a U.S. Treasury Department investments tax credit of up to 25% on more than $100 billion in qualified investments and eligibility for federal loans of up to $11 billion there, as we mentioned. And then it also kind of adds on to what Intel had already announced with their plans to invest more than $100 billion over five years to expand U.S. chip making um, as we're trying to kind of decentralize it away from what had been the fabrication process largely to this point of Taiwan Semiconductor uh, and some of the other global foundries. Yeah, this exactly goes to what Pat Gelsinger has said here at Yahoo Finance, what he has also said on recent earnings calls, yeah. just in terms of the direction of Intel going forward as the company does look to regain some of that momentum that it has lost here over the last several months. So the significance here, of course, is what this is going to mean more broadly speaking to the U.S. chip business here in the U.S. as many of these chip makers uh, rely more heavily on U.S. production thanks to the funding that they are getting from the CHIPS Act from the Biden administration. I think also, though, the question over the next couple of years is how quickly this money is going to be able to be put to work and how quickly we are going to start seeing some of the benefits from these investments. Because sure. this is something that is not going to happen, obviously, overnight. It's going to take years to come to fruition. So this is all part of Intel's plan. Not an exact surprise that we're seeing the stock up about 2% on this news. But like you said, it's extremely significant. Almost $20 billion in total here with $8.5 billion in grants and then up to $11 billion in loan funding here for the future. And obviously, the ploy here 
year to make the U.S. and many of its chip giants even more competitive on that global stage and bringing uh, manufacturing back here to the U.S., which we know has been a priority for the Biden administration over the last several years. Yeah, absolutely. Very uh, varied, at least in region right yeah. now. you got Arizona, New Mexico, Ohio, and Oregon. We were just talking about Oregon the other day. That was on a housing conversation, so separately, and I'll leave that to the side yeah, there. Well, more jobs are going to be created there, too. Yeah. All right, well, coming up, Chipotle shares climbing higher on news of its 50-for-1 stock split. We will break down some of the top trending tickers here at Yahoo Finance next. Time for some trending tickers. Shares of Chipotle climbing higher after the company's board of directors approved a 50 for one split of its common stock on Tuesday. It's on track to become one of the largest stock splits in New York Stock Exchange history. Yahoo Finance's Alexandra Canal joins us with the details. Ali, what do we know? Yeah, Brad, well, basically, it's, this comes down to the stock has been too hot. We are hovering near record highs that the board is saying, OK, we need to make this stock more affordable to investors. So basically, how this works is one share of Chipotle, which right now in pre-market trading, right around 2,940 bucks a share, that's going to be split into 50 50 smaller chunks, again, for that affordability. If you already own a share of Chipotle, you are going to receive 49 additional shares. So it doesn't change the valuation. But like I said, this company has just been on a tear when it comes to its stock price. We've seen earnings come in especially strong due to increased demand, a wealthier customer base, price hikes. So this seems to be the right moment for this company. We have seen other notable stock splits in the past. Alphabet and Amazon had a 20 20 for one stock split in 2022. Most recently, we saw Walmart commit to a three for one stock split. But 50 for one is one, the first stock split in Chipotle's 30 year history, and two, just a magnificent number that we don't really see quite often. So Chipotle said they're going to go on a hiring spree this spring, that they are, you know, committed to investing in the business. And investors, they seem pretty down with this plan. The stock is up 5% in pre market trading. Uh, however, shareholders are going to have to vote to get this through. So a, a shareholder vote is June 6. If it's approved, you can start seeing those affordable shares start trading on the market on June 26. Yeah. So perhaps this summer, 
We are going to have a lot more Chipotle. Yeah, and of course, <laughs> the, the the conversation then leads to the exposure that they could get a cheaper stock if it's right. going to be included in uh, more averages. Obviously, the Dow has been floated yeah. there. Mm -hmm. when the likelihood of that is up for debate. We're going to be talking to an analyst next yeah. hour about it, what we could see for Chipotle. And it makes forward. you think what other stocks? Maybe there's an NVIDIA stock split. Mm -hmm. I know Jensen Wong, he told it's CNBC that right. we'll think about it. Mm -hmm. So yeah. you never know. But I mean, Chipotle, it's, it is a very expensive stock. It's extremely well, expensive so. stock. If it was the split today, it would come in around, well, based on what we're seeing now pre-market. If it touches $3,000 pre-market, coming around 60 bucks a share. Wow. Here. Yeah, if it was the split today, of course, mm -hmm. still needs to be voted on pre-market. I saw it trading at, yeah, there we go, 29.42. Before Just the below 3,000. All right, Allie, thanks so much. Thank you. We are also watching shares of Boeing this morning, a top trading ticker on Yahoo Finance. The move to the downside here, off just about 1.5%. The company announcing that it's going to push back its cash flow goal as it limits production of its 737 jets. Now, CFO Brian West is saying at a, at a Bank of America conference that Boeing expects cash burn in the first quarter to be higher than they planned back in January. They're now seeing a cash burn rate of somewhere between 4 and 4.5%. Billion. Now, this comes as Boeing and its major supplier, Spirit Aerosystems, are under scrutiny following the January 5th Alaska Airlines incident. And, of course, we're seeing the pressure on the stock here today. And, Brad, I was going through a quick uh, analyst reaction to this news. And, obviously, not a massive surprise. I think to the degree, though, of that cash burn rate in terms of what we are expect what, we what Boeing is experiencing here in the current quarter of just about four to four and a half billion, I think how quickly they are able to recover from this is is a critical factor here in the fact that they are no longer too confident or they're saying they're not going to reach their cash flow goals here until the end of their initially projected range. Yeah, I think for Boeing as well, in the immediate cash burn that they're anticipating and now having to communicate to the street, they're, they're speaking, of course, today, Brian West is at the B of A Global Industrials Conference. It's also going to come with a larger mindset of how does this impact orders in the future? Orders that, number one, for some airlines, they're waiting to receive and perhaps the exercising of some of those options to purchase additional ones now hampered. And then even further out from that, new contracts that you would sign at places like the Paris Air Show, places that uh, the Dubai Air Show, all of these key points where a Boeing leans on some of the existing relationships that it has with the airline operators who some of them cutting back on the capacity, cutting back on the routes in this near term period of time, because that means that they're going to have to keep more aircraft in circulation for longer until until they take on some of the newer ones that they had anticipated getting by 2025 in some instances for Delta that's now pushed back to 2026, 2027. And so as those schedules are pushed back, that also impacts some of the orders that Boeing sees come through. In the near term, though, you've got analysts saying that maybe Airbus is, yeah. a, is a viable trade here. So uh, that is something that we'll continue to watch and where, that, uh, where the dust settles there as well. Certainly, will. Right. Boeing shares under pressure just ahead of the open. We've got the opening bell for you in just about two and a half minutes. More of your market coverage ahead. We'll be right back.
They're taking a live look at the opening bell at the New York Stock Exchange and at the NASDAQ in Midtown Manhattan, where you've got, at the NASDAQ, Astera Labs ringing the opening bell there. Woo! Got enough people for a football team up there and some fun Fetty. It's got to be a uh, good time. All right. Anyway, taking a look at the New York Stock Exchange, you've also got Redwood ringing the opening bell there. So, a lot of bright, cheering faces on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange there. Let's go to the Wi-Fi Interactive. Let's take a look at how things are opening up here on the day. We were mixed coming in to the start of today's trading activity. I'll put this on a three-day view so you really get the synopsis of what we've seen coming into the start of today's trade over the course of the past few days. Three days up, eight-tenths of a percent. Two-day down, two-tenths of a percent. But early innings, folks, so uh, just... Uh, breath of fresh air, I guess. Well, just take a breather. Anyway, NASDAQ Composite, you're seeing that higher over the past three days by about 1.4%. And then additionally, the uh, NASDAQ Composite here on the day down or higher by about two tenths of a percent. Also some green for the S&P 500, just barely. It's flat, just barely to the upside by two hundredths of a percent. Past three days, still looking good though. Let's take a look at some heat map. We heard you like heat, so here's some heat for you. Taking a look at the NASDAQ, we've got some green on the screen. Microsoft, Google, NVIDIA. Amazon and Meta in positive territory right now. Apple, though, that's down by about one-tenth of a percent. Let's take a look at some of the sector activity here. 11 S&P 500 sectors. We've got them fired up for you here on the screen. And uh, we're roughly split, as split as you could get, I guess, for uh, 11 sectors here. It looks like, uh, actually, it looks like we've got four gainers right now. So um, not necessarily split anymore. But XLRE bringing up the caboose. That's down by about one percent here. Uh, but leading the charge, there you see communication services. That's up by about a quarter of a percent. You've also got discretionary and technology. That's up by about one-tenth of a percent here, blinding me with science. All right, Shauna, over to you. All right, Brad, great stuff there. Let, let's talk about one of those trending tickers here at the Open, and that's General Mills. Now, the stock is moving to the upside here this morning, up just about 5%. They beat on revenue. They also reaffirmed their full-year 2024 guidance. Now, the Cheerios maker saying that cost savings and also price hikes helped profits uh, move to the upside side here during their fiscal third quarter. They also, though, noted that it's keeping a close eye on the economy and what they're seeing from the consumer, persistent inflation, also supply chain stability are just some of the factors that General Mills is warning could impact future performance. But when you take a look at the recent uh, numbers that we were just getting out here from General Mills, the revenue B was supported here by favorable weather is what they said, also growth in some of their non-measured channels and cost savings that do remain robust in terms of the streets reaction. Zuho, one of the analysts chiming in, saying that this is actually a positive surprise here for General Mills. But, Brad, the question is, is exactly what General Mills laid out in their earnings call is just the uncertainty about the macroeconomic backdrop over the next several months and exactly the power of the consumer, the purchasing power, where that is going to fall is critical here for General Mills and so many of its competitors. Yeah, I think you're spot on here. And I think looking at the segments particularly, that's immediately where my, my eyes went when I looked at this report. I turned to my right uh, to our, our one of our top producers, Sydney, and I said, look at the segments here. You've got declines across North America retail, across pet, across North America, well, food service was flat. International, that was down four points here. So essentially, volumes were down but they increased price. And so that was one of the elements here that really stuck out to me. How long are they going to be able to input more price into the system with some of the macro headwinds that you just cited? And that is the larger question. Yeah, it is. And we've already started to see some backlash from some of the competitors out there. People simply are not buying as much they can't afford it because of persistent inflation. So some of the volume growth uh, has been hurt just a bit. But again, how much more they are able to offset the increase in the input cost with higher prices and the fact that consumers are still willing to pay. Some of these uh, consumer staples are getting a little expensive. Did you have a favorite cereal days. growing up? Oh, um, I would have to say Cinnamon Toast Crunch. Oh, done deal. All yeah. right, cool. Maybe Fruit Loops. Yeah. Lucky Charms. It's a good day when you get on. a Cinnamon Toast Crunch shout out. Sydney got a shout out, even though she's still trying to make Bittercoin work. <laughs> we'll workshop that. All right, guys, let's get to another trending ticker here. We've got to take a look at Samsung. Now, shares moving higher following several reports 
that surfaced that NVIDIA is in conversations to buy next generation chips from the company. Now, this is tied to comments that NVIDIA CEO Jensen Wong made here to uh, reporters just about the impact that they see Samsung potentially having on their business. They could be looking to Samsung for memory chips. Now, it certainly is an endorsement we have seen over the last several days that if your company's name comes out of Jensen Wong's mouth, you will likely see a reaction to the upside in shares. Investors will be very encouraged encouraged by that. So again, we're looking at a gain of just about 5% today. But I think this move to the upside, the biggest move that we've seen in a couple months here for Samsung, just speaks to the fact that they are trying to regain some of that momentum within their business. Clearly, a partnership here could be a huge boost to the upside. Yeah, they've got some big plans over at Samsung, especially for the production of that AI chip. We're anticipating that in the first half. We'll see when that ultimately comes out. Uh, they did release a statement as well to shareholders, um, and they're going to continue to ad advance their 12-stack HBM technology and seek to regain leadership in the sector in the future, uh, also reaffirming a, a major investment in a memory chip research center in South Korea this year. Expects around $100 million in revenue there from some of the product packaging that they're going to do on the chip side here, too. So Samsung, ultimately, good past year. It's up by about 27%. We'll see what significant effort uh, or what significance uh, for the stock price reaction this partnership here with NVIDIA brings forward as well. Let's take another look at another trending ticker. We're tracking PDD, Pinduo Duo, shares surging this morning after reporting earnings and revenue far above expectations. Parent company of Timu here saying growing demand in the quarter was driven by encouraging consumer sentiment. Uh, probably also helps when you run like 15 Super Bowl ads yeah. as well. Uh, no doubt the shares benefiting, reacting positively here. They're up by about 9, 10% as of right now. Yeah, and it was tough to miss a Timu ad during the Super Bowl. They certainly ran many of those games. They have been upping their spending, their marketing spend here in the U.S. that at least seems to be paying off when you take a look at these results. And they've also been spending, or their spend was far beyond the Super Bowl. When you talk about their app platforms, including Meta and Alphabet's Google, they, they were continuing to increase their spend here in the U.S. Competition with Amazon. We'll talk about this a little bit later, but Amazon actually launching its first spring sale is what they're calling it. And many analysts are saying they're doing it because of increased competition from Timu, from some of these Chinese e-commerce players here. So they are able or they are starting and have been taking market share here. And they're finding they're, it's be, they are resonating, I should say, with American consumers and it's paying off. They're trying to get me. They're yeah. trying to get me, finally. They know I don't have Prime. They're trying to finally get me to sign up for Prime here uh, eventually at some point. I mean, but just getting me into the ecosystem and making my yeah. first Amazon purchase. Maybe that's what I do on the sale date. Maybe. We'll see. But for Pinduo Duo, I mean, no doubt, when you take a look at some of the results, the increase of 123% in total yeah. revenues, that no doubt should catch a few eyes out there as well. They said 2023 represented a pivotal chapter in the corporate history, transitioning towards high-quality development, and then and additionally, in 2024, remaining dedicated to further improving consumer experiences, enhancing technology innovation. That sounds maybe like a little bit of CapEx could be thrown into the mix there. And then generating positive impacts in communities. We'll see exactly uh, what that means going forward from here. But high quality development strategy is, is what they are really trying to pound the pavement on and linger on here yeah. in the message to us. Yeah, I think when they, those numbers that you just rattled off is pretty much a blowout report from many of the metrics that yeah. we did see. We're seeing that reaction. And also keep in mind they're doing this at a time when China's economy is still struggling, when the consumer doesn't have much spending power here, so they're able to scale their business in other parts of the world and it's being able to offset some of the slowdown that we have seen still play out in China. Yeah, we did get some interesting data out from China to start off the week, showing that at least industrials and retail came in above expectations. But again, uh, that is the nation state yeah. data, so we'll, uh, we'll see exactly where it continues to show up in some of the corporate data as well mm -hmm. here. And just pair them together. We've got all your markets action straight ahead. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance. Yahoo Finance is well. Is your guide, your group of advisors, planners, and jargon busters to help you save, build, and grow your money. How do I know if I'm saving enough for retirement? How do I know if it's right for me to go on that lavish vacation? Is it finally time to refinance my mortgage? How do I pay less in taxes? We'll get you the answers you need. Wealth, earning it, growing it, and managing it. 
It's more than tracking just the latest market moves. It's more than your favorite trending pickers. One does not simply build wealth without considering the entire financial landscape. It takes a community, and we've built one for you. Wealth cuts through the noise to help guide your financial decisions so that your money works for you. Wealth on Yahoo Finance premieres March 25th. Yields are ticking slightly lower here ahead of the Federal, Federal Reserve's latest interest rate decision and latest economic projections. Now, here to talk about what this could mean for your portfolio, we want to bring in Willem Sells. He is HSBC's Global Private Banking and Wealth Global Chief Investment Officer. It's great to see you there. Well, so how are you thinking about what we are going to hear from Fed Chair Jay Powell, and will it at all affect your strategy here going forward? Um, you know, obviously, it will be uh, interesting to watch, uh, you know, more the language rather than the action. Yeah. I don't think the Fed will do anything, um, you know, at this meeting. We still think they will start to cut in June. Um, but the language is obviously very important because the market has been reassessing, you know, how many rate hikes we exactly are going to get this year and, and starting when. Um, you know, but the prospect of rate cuts, right? Um, the prospect of rate cuts um, is, is obviously, an, um, you know, very positive for markets. And therefore, we have been putting our cash to work. Typically, what happens is that both bonds and equities rally well ahead, um, you know, of that first rate cut. And, um, you know, that's indeed uh, what we're seeing again as well. Where is the hottest spot to put cash to work right now, Willem? Um, the U.S., um, actually. Um, and, um, you know, we continue to be overweight on U.S. stocks. Um, uh, the U.S. 
the economy has been very resilient and it's not just the economy, it's also the earnings, um, you know, which continue to grow um, together with the margins actually in the US. Um, and that's, um, you know, the standout really around the world. The other country that we like um, to add to that, um, in part because of its um, own uh, local situation, but also because it helps really diversify portfolio is Japan. Um, where we're also seeing that positive momentum. Um, and there is a reflation trade now in Japan. Actually getting a little bit of inflation is a good thing. Um, and that's um, you know why we um, uh, also have an overweight on Japan. You know, it's interesting, based on some of the, the fact set uh, analysis of the earnings that we've seen so far this quarter, for, for Q1 2024, this is looking forward then uh, in current quarter analysis, 78 S&P 500 companies issuing negative EPS guidance, 32 issuing positive EPS guidance. When you think about ultimately what companies are, are trying to get ahead of and trying to spell out to investors, you know, why in this case is the hotspot U.S. equities and, and on the back of uh, some of the guidance and some of the earnings that's expected? Yeah, we often get to question, is it just the max seven that mm. is, um, you know, that are driving the earnings? And, you know, to some extent, if you look at the sector composition, of where you see that earnings growth, they will immediately reject that hypothesis because um, you know we do see earnings growth in um, you know technology, positive earnings revisions in technology and communications where there are some max sevens, but we're also see it, seeing it in the industrial space and in the financials. So it is more broad based than people think, and that's why you know we want to broaden that exposure as well. The other question that we get is around valuation of the max seven. Um, but given that we also see earnings growth elsewhere, we're happy to broaden that sector exposure to these other sectors, and that helps lower your average valuation somewhat. Well, um, do you see any validity or any reason to be concerned about tech valuations or this talk here of an AI bubble? Um, AI, in my view, is going to spread. Um, you know, whatever uh, client that I talk to, and obviously we have many business owners amongst our clients, every single business owner tells me that they're using AI to some extent already. Sometimes it's marginal, but in many cases, it's already actually reasonably su substantial in the area of ordering and inventory management, but also logistics, um, you know, their client servicing and so on. So I do think this is something that is really going to come and going to spread from those couple of companies, that handful of companies that so far are benefiting to a much broader area. Um, and that will lead to productivity gains um, you know, which to some extent you're starting to see already. And in that productivity gains, how does that pass through as well from your estimation to profitability gains as well? Yeah, so as you have that profit, uh, productivity gains, you become, um, you know, with, uh, with the same uh, number of, of uh, you know, workers. I don't think, by the way, that there will be huge layoffs on the back of this, so that's the positive news. Um, but with the same amount of workers, you get that uh, AI that acts as a co-pilot, if you want, um, or a helper to those workers to make them more product productive. Um, that leads to more output um, uh, at the same, you know, labor market costs therefore increases earnings and that helps um, um, the earnings growth and therefore ultimately um, the stock market. Well, um, while we have you, I got to ask you about the moves that we've seen within crypto right now, because Bitcoin obviously surging, then we've seen a pullback here today. Bring that up just in terms of the risk perspective or risk appetite that we're seeing from investors right now. How are you looking at the investor interest within crypto and, and factoring that into where you are seeing some of the opportunity within the market? Yeah, we're not very active in this space. There is, um, uh, I do think that uh, there is a link, obviously, to the launch of that ETF. I think there is also an, an element of diversification that people are looking for. That diversification we find, you know, across also traditional asset classes. So what, how we are dealing with it, um, you know, is to make sure that we have both, both bonds and equity. It's easier now to hold bonds with the interest rates and the yields, you know, much more attractive than a few years ago. Um, so that in complement to your equities, but also alternatives. So alternative assets includes private equity, private credit, where people can own that, together with infrastructure. Infrastructure for us is one of the most exciting asset classes because it really taps into, um, you know, that re-onshoring, um, the data-led economy, and also the net zero transition. A huge, huge investment that needs to take place, not just in the U.S. but also in Europe and even in Asia as well. Um, and that helps diversify infrastructure has a link as well in terms of its returns to um, inflation. So if people are worried about sticky inflation, it might be an asset class to consider. 
Willem Sells, who is the HSBC Global Private Banking and Wealth Global Chief Investment Officer. Willem, thanks so much for taking the time today. Real pleasure. Certainly. We've got all your markets action ahead. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance. It's a jam-packed hour focusing on the biggest movers and shakers on Wall Street. This is market domination, and here, every day is game day. We have one hour left until the market close. It's game time for investors to make their final plays. The clock is ticking, and we've got you covered with our quarter-by-quarter -quarter playbook. We're bringing you in on all the market action. With step-by-step -step analysis of our biggest trending tickers and expert insight into the day's biggest headlines. We'll bring you the closing bell and get you to the finish line. This is Market, Market Domination. Domination. Tune in daily from 3 to 4 p.m. Eastern. Luxury group Kering warning that its Gucci brand sales look set to fall roughly 20% in the first quarter. This comes amid uncertainty around demand out of China. Shares of Kering plummeting right now. They're down by about 13.8%. Interesting here, and especially as we're getting some more calls after what has come forward from the company, you've got even more of this look at luxury coming out of B of A, specifically uh, underlying data for the first quarter to date, slightly better than expected in the U.S. and Europe, but Asia demand 
is more mixed as of right now. It is more mixed, but at least from Bank of America's uh, perspective, it is starting to improve a little bit, and you would think that that would obviously bode well for many of these luxury retailers. They did note that Chinese consumer confidence has picked up or did pick up in January following what had been a muted nine months there. However, though, still well below the levels that they had seen pre-2022. So they do expect Chinese revenues to be up about 10 percent in Q1 overall, mainland China, though, negative. So what this all means for luxury retailers that maybe the worst is behind them in terms of that fall off in demand, especially with what we saw play out in China specifically. But in terms of that turnaround story or being able to really pick up some of that momentum, that might be a couple of months, a couple of quarters out, at least when you take into account the commentary that we're getting from many of these luxury retailers most recently. And then it's also important to point out, and I think interesting to point out, just the performance of carrying specifically Gucci and stacking that up against Hermes and stacking it up against against LVMH, Louis Vuitton, which has performed better than what we have seen play out at Gucci. We know Gucci, like you had said, is just so critical to the overall performance of carrying, given the fact that about two thirds of carrying sales is tied to Gucci. So Gucci does have a bit of an issue just in terms of resonating with the luxury consumer. So that is critical for them to be able to regain some of that lost momentum. Yeah, really interesting here. They, they talk about, and the upside risks to their price objective here, one of them being a, a growth investment, macro pickup as like for like and growth investment are dependent on demand for apparel. That is the upside risk. That has historically been correlated to global GDP growth. They're also citing second here, but potential resurgence in Gucci brand momentum or higher than expected brand strength at Bottega Veneta. Uh, Bottega Veneta. I mean, you can really tell that I'm not the ideal customer here uh, or just in a different bracket in entirety. But the downside risk here uh, is a macro slowdown, is brand weakness, failure to sustain outperformance at Gucci, sharper than expected slowdown in momentum at Saint Laurent. I can mention that one. They had that at Century 21 and an unsuccessful turnaround at Bottega of Aneda. I think I got it right. You got it. That time. Yeah, not bad. Yeah. I'll give it to you. I'm trying. I'm yeah, trying. trying. I got to call up Oliver Chen. He, go. He's got all the pronunciations down. He knows down. it all at the tip yeah. of his tongue. All right, guys, keep it right here on Yahoo Finance. Much more of your market action ahead. We're about 30 minutes into the trading day. You're looking at red across the screen for the major averages. We'll be right back. Yahoo Finance is well is your guide, your group of advisors, planners, and jargon busters to help you save, build, and grow your money. How do I know if I'm saving enough for retirement? How do I know if it's right for me to go on that lavish vacation? Is it finally time to refinance my mortgage? How do I pay less in taxes? We'll get you the answers you need. Well, earning it, growing it, and managing it. It's more than tracking just the latest market moves. It's more than your favorite trending pictures. One does not simply build wealth without considering the entire financial landscape. It takes a community, and we've built one for you. Wealth cuts through the noise to help guide your financial decisions so that your money works for you. Wealth on Yahoo Finance premieres March 25th.
Welcome back. I'm Brad Smith alongside Shauna Smith. We're 30 minutes into the trading day. Let's take a look at how things are shaping up right now. On this Fed day, to all who celebrate, 2.30 p.m. is when we'll hear from Fed Chair Jay Powell. Of course, 2 p.m. is when the decision comes out. Stocks flat and cautious trading is investors. They're looking ahead to that policy decision just hours away. All right, let's take a look at some of those trending tickers. First up, J. Jill shares are popping after reporting better than expected net sales for the fourth quarter. You're looking at the gain of just about 8%. They beat on their earnings. They also saw profit that rose from just about a year ago. However, the lifestyle brand is continuing to take a cautious approach here with respect to the macro environment, warning just about the stability of consumers. And shares of Mobileye jumping after announcing an agreement with Volkswagen, uh, Volkswagen ADMT for autonomous autonomous driving. Mobileye is going to develop and supply software, hardware components, and digital maps for the self-driving ID. Now together, the companies will bring together new automated driving functions to series production here. All right, and let's also take a look at Signet Jewelers because they are dropping into the red despite, de despite beating earnings estimates for the fourth quarter. The company delivering a lower than expected sales outlook for the full year and for the first quarter. Signet Jewelers CEO noting that expectations for sequential same store sales improved over the, over the year as engagements gradually recover. And turning now to shares of JetBlue as the company looks to eliminate some flight routes and, and service at several cities. The move coming after the termination of its merger with budget carrier Spirit Airlines. We should also note it comes after we saw a challenge, a successful challenge to the Northeastern Alliance that it had with American Airlines. That, of course, uh, much of the discussion last year and ultimately now it's put JetBlue in a position um, to try and figure out where they're going to spur in a, a demand environment that is increasingly leaning more premium, where it's going to spur more of those opportunities to continue to uh, transport consumers and ultimately the company saying when they moved away from and had to scrap that deal with Spirit that it was going to give some additional details on the long-term strategy, the initiatives for costs, and that investor day is going to take place on May 30th. We'll see what more they have to say going ahead of that event and into that event as well. Yeah, it certainly will. I mean, this is a company obviously struggling just in terms of regaining that momentum and has seen pressure on its business. Obviously, the fact that the merger with Spirit was blocked, adding some uncertainty there, some questions about their ability to compete with those larger players, Brad, that you were just talking about. So the fact that they are realigning or, re or adjusting, I should say, their routes are focusing on the routes that they see as more profitable. Now, when you take a look, many of those is on the East Coast. Puerto Rico, they're also announcing more routes or more service to Orlando, one of the other airports, and Tampa, uh, where they are adding capacity. So JetBlue, it's been under some pressure. Revenue had been falling. They also posted a net loss there. So at least the argument that they are making is that these adjustments are going to pay off in the long run and will help the airline better compete with some of those larger players. Yeah, nine routes out of LA, it sounds like, among those impacted here. Also some of those Fort La uh, Lauderdale, Florida flights. Uh, and then Kansas City, Missouri found itself uh, really linked in with some of the more exotic flight routes that this company was taking to Bogota, Colombia, and Quito, Ecuador, Lima, Peru as well. And then uh, naturally they mentioned Kansas City, Missouri right after that. <laughs> right. Let's, let's get to back to the big story of the day, and that is the Fed. Widely expected to hold rates steady when the central bank concludes its policy meeting today. But the big question is going to be what the dot plot signals and what that's going to do potentially to a risk of a recession. Here with the details, Yahoo Finance's Josh Schaefer. Josh, if we do see any sort of adjustment in the dot plot, say it goes down maybe only two cuts before the end of the year, maybe only 25 basis points of cuts for the end of the year, what does that do anything? to raise the risk so of a recession? The, the key with that would be, right, so remember last year everyone had a recession call because of how tightening normally works, right? We tighten lending standard, we tighten lending conditions, companies have to pay more to borrow money, and then eventually they need to make up for those costs somewhere. You usually see that in layoffs, and then you have a problem in the labor market, then people have less money, and then we have this whole spiral, and that's how you get to a recession. That was why the 2023 recession call was so popular. Well, when I talked to economists at the end of the year, they said, quite simply, history didn't repeat itself like it normally does. Mm -hmm. In some ways, this time thus far, thus far, has been different because of the different aspects of the COVID-19 pandemic and sort of the unraveling of that and the stimulus we put in the economy. 
a concern among economists still is, yes, we're doing very good right now. But what if we keep rates higher for longer? What if they don't cut it all this year? At what point could that maybe have some filter through? And so you mentioned the dot pot, Sean, and the, the thing to highlight here is it's still called the summary of economic projections. Mm -hmm. We're talking a lot about dots, and we're talking mm -hmm. a lot about are we going to see two cuts or one cut when we look at that dot plot. But also key to note in this summary of economic projections, does the Fed see GDP going up? Mm -hmm. Because they don't have a very high projection for GDP for this year right now. It's not as high as the streets. Do they agree with Wall Street that we are doing better as an economy? What is the unemployment rate that they see at the end of this year? Mm -hmm. Remember, the unemployment rate just ticked up from 3.7% in January to 3.9% in February. That is normally a little bit of at least a yellow signal for people if that continues. Because once the unemployment rate continues to tick up a little bit more and we hit that SOM rule on a three-month basis of we're seeing it start to tick up, that is when it sort of spirals. Mm -hmm. So it'll be interesting just to see overall, I think, what Jerome Powell says about the state of the economy, not just today, but moving forward in these meetings. He has been very outspoken in the last couple of meetings talking positively about the economy. Mm -hmm. The economy has surprised us. The economy is performing well. Consumers are in good shape. Does that hold up? Because right now, we have plenty of strategists that have come on this air that are saying, if we take away a cut, it might not matter for stocks. Things are st still can be OK. The next thing they say is because the economy is doing well. Mm -hmm. Like the economy is sort of the key here if we're going to stay higher for longer, if we can stay resilient. And maybe we don't get a ton of information on that yet because we haven't seen the data fully fall off. Mm -hmm. But it's going to be the thing to watch, I think, between this meeting and next meeting and going into June, July, when we're worried about if we're going to get a cut. How, how much do you think we get a clear signal from the Fed here? As I'm sitting here looking at the CME Fed Watch probability tool that says in June, 60% probability of a cut. Is he ever clear? It, I, I feel like part of his job, seriously, though, is to not be overly clear, right? Mm -hmm. Because I or think to give it away. Right. To sort of basically talk around it and say that they still need more confidence and things like that. Because, Brad, I think when we look at how the rise in markets in some ways loosens financial conditions, right? And if we were to have yields fall again significantly today, you, you're loosening conditions at some point. I don't think the Fed wants to see a 2% rally after today's meeting. I don't yeah. think we need that right now. I don't think they need that. I think perhaps maybe the tick up in yields and the little bit of tightening that's done as the market is readjusted has helped the Fed in some ways in sort of keeping things tight. Yeah, I just think what's going to be so interesting in listening to Powell's testimony here this afternoon is just going to be kind of going off of what you were saying, this rising risk of recession if in fact the Fed does hold rates higher for longer, just how that's factoring in to their thinking right now, right? But just in terms of how he's even assessing that sort of situation and that risk out there. Yeah. Because even in the most recent notes that we're getting from top economists, from top strategists on the street, there is a pretty wide gap in terms of what that real risk is and how quickly, if the Fed does in fact keep rates too high, how quickly they are able to reverse some of the damage that would have already been done at that point. Be curious if someone uses the phrase maintenance cuts when they're asking them questions yes. today, because that's what a lot of economists call it, right? Mm -hmm. We're talking about maybe two rate cuts this year, right? Maybe three. 50 basis points to 75 basis points. It's not huge, but they call them maintenance cuts for a reason, and it's to make sure you're giving the economy a little bit of help. Yeah. It's not to really loosen things. We don't need a lot of help now. Mm -hmm. You would if you were yeah. potentially going into recession, but it's a maintenance cut. It's a little bit of a trim. Mm -hmm. Just, okay, we're still waiting for inflation to come down. We feel relatively confident in that trend. Let's just cut by 25 you know, maybe in the first half of this year, maybe starting in the second half of this year, just to help folks out a little bit. It would also maybe help out some of the issues you're seeing in the housing market. And the Fed has only so much it can do there, but it would probably help bring mortgage rates down. It just gives a little bit of overall loosening to the economy. Mm -hmm. And you'd think at some point this year, maybe we need that. Or maybe the resilient consumer just holds up and every economic data point keeps beating that for the next true. 12 months. Yeah, a, re a resiliency treat. Can't just anything yeah. yeah, all right, Josh, thanks so much. All right, we're gonna be watching closely, 2 p.m. We know you will as well. Everyone, we're also continuing to watch shares of CMG, Chipotle Mexican Grill. Chipotle could get a whole lot cheaper. The board of the fast casual restaurant chain approving a 50 for one stock split in order to make shares more accessible to staff and investors. 
and we're seeing the stock top $3,000 in share in reaction to this news. If you split the stock at current levels, it would trade at around 60 bucks a share. So here with more, we've got Nick Satian, who is the Wedbush Securities Managing Director. Nick, great to see you as always. I want to get your perspective here. And we know that there are a ranging amount of reasons, perhaps, for this decision and the board moving forward with this. And then it's going to come to shareholders voting to approve. But what does this do for the average investor, the retail investor out there? Does it change the propensity to buy into Chipotle? Yeah, well, we've seen this with uh, with other splits. Uh, you know, it, it definitely does. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so the, the the demand for Chipotle shares is definitely going to go up later this year post this uh, split, and and mainly driven by retail investors. They tend to, uh, you know, view lower price stocks as as more attractive, and uh, you know, a lot of times it actually meets their threshold. So if someone's buying, let's say, five hundred dollars a month. Uh, or a thousand dollars a month. Well, you can't buy a Chipotle if you can't get fractional shares. So it just makes it more available, and the demand goes up. Yeah, Nick. There's absolutely no change here, j just in terms of the fundamentals of the business. But just a question for you, just in terms of that interest they're going off of that, obviously making it more affordable. But the inclusion here in indexes potentially the broader exposure. How do you view that as an analyst in terms of what it could potentially boost? Uh, how big of a boost it could be for the stock in the longer term? I don't know if it's going to change the inclusion in in in, in indexes. I know that uh, you know a lot of algorithms, et cetera, uh, they get annoyed when this happens just because there's a little bit more volatility that they have to you know put into their models. Uh, uh, you know, if you're uh, trying to arbitrage the stocks versus the indexes, et cetera. But essentially, at the end of the day, um, it's not going to impact inclusion in in indexes, et cetera. So really, I mean, net net, it just overall increases demand and trading. Uh, in the stock. And so, Nick, as you continue to think about what Chipotle can do to, you know, aside from the stock price and, and what we're going to see that eventually move towards, what they can do to continue to just keep part of this consumer wallet right now where consumers are trying to figure out, OK, do I spend a little bit more into that, that guac in that Chipotle experience? Or, or do I say, you know what, just hold the chips. I'll, I'll see you next week and perhaps pick up a, a, you know, a burrito or a bowl or something like that. What are the real mechanisms, the levers that Chipotle can pull right now? You know, it's been very surprising in terms of how well Chipotle has done when some, some others have seen a slowdown. Uh, in terms of just that, in terms of attach rates, uh, you know, the overall spend, uh, the the lower income customer uh, slowing down a bit. Well, you know, last quarter they said we saw growth across all income, you know, segments, and we really haven't seen a slowdown at Chipotle. Uh, they've been very, very successful at, in in terms of their 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 menu innovation, the carne asada, which you know ended earlier this month, was was very very successful. So that drove a lot of the same store sales growth. The chicken, uh, uh, the Dal Pastor, uh, it, you know, came out March 12th. Uh, that has actually uh, continued to drive some momentum. Now the tougher compares uh, get in the way in the second half. So really, you know, Q3, Q4 is 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 I think when Chipotle gets really judged uh, in terms of their ability to, to to anniversary some of these tougher comps, especially with that much pricing in the system. Uh, and then the other part of this conversation is California. They have. You know, about 15% of their stores in California, the wage rates there are going up to $20 an hour uh, from, you know, right around $16.50. Uh, that's a big, you know, inflationary headwind. And they're having to take high single digit pricing in California to offset it. So it'll be interesting to see how consumers react in California to some of these changes, uh, which, you know, obviously the timing coincides with the end of, of carne asada and the launch of El Pastor. So there's a couple of things we're watching there. Nick, what's your estimate on that, just in terms of the impact that that could potentially have to Chipotle's bottom line? In terms of the California wage, yeah. wage increases? You know, as of right now, we don't think it's going to have much of an impact because they're going to actually be able to offset um, all of it with the high, high, high single digit price increase. Now, they're in a kind of unique position in that they have enough demand to be able to take that kind of pricing. Uh, and even if you see some of the transactions, transactions shift, uh, you know, the price increases is, is, is obviously going to boost the comp and that should flow through to the bottom line. So as of right now, we're under the assumption that they're going to be able to offset a lot of that hit. Uh, others aren't so lucky uh, in terms of the peer set. 
even post 51 split, does Chipotle still look more attractive than a McDonald's out there? We know that you were bullish on that name to start off the year. Yeah, I still like McDonald's. I mean, in, in, a, in an environment where the consumer is is hyper focused on check management, I think McDonald's is gonna is gonna win. I have been surprised, you know, at the continued momentum at Chipotle, given the average check and the amount of pricing they've taken over the past, you know, three years or so, over thirty percent, uh, and you know, with that much pushback from the consumer. So uh, I'm I'm really nervous around the second half in terms of some of these tough compares without carne asada. We'll see if Al Pastor is you know a lot more popular than than carne asada it can't just be as popular right it has to be even more popular to drive that incremental transaction so if transaction growth slows uh you know just given the comparison with with carne asada and some of these you know price increases in california um yeah i'm a little nervous that uh, chipotle's valuation may not necessarily hold up all right well chipotle at least for today up just about eight percent nick real quick before we let you go if their valuation doesn't hold up what does that downside then potentially look like as of right now, my, my price target is is twenty four hundred, uh, and I have a neutral rating. Changing that anytime soon? I can't comment. I can't comment. <laughs> okay. I, I, can, I can get I can get fined if I say. Anything. <laughs> All right, Nick that. Zetan, we're gonna have to have you back. We appreciate you taking the time to join us here this morning, Nick Zetan, uh, Webbush of of Webbush Securities. Thanks, Nick. Thanks for having me. All right, keep right here on Yahoo Finance. Much more of your market action ahead. We'll be right back. Yahoo Finance is wealth is your guide, your group of advisors, planners, and jargon busters to help you save, build, and grow your money. How do I know if I'm saving enough for retirement? How do I know if it's right for me to go on that lavish vacation? Is it finally time to refinance my mortgage? How do I pay less in taxes? We'll get you the answers you need. Wealth, earning it, growing it, and managing it. It's more than tracking just the latest market moves. It's more than your favorite trending tickers. One does not simply build wealth without considering the entire financial landscape. It takes a community, and we've built one for you. Wealth cuts through the noise to help guide your financial decisions so that your money works for you. Wealth on Yahoo Finance premieres March 25th.
The U.S. housing market seeing some bright spots. Housing starts in February rising nearly 11 percent, well above January's revised estimate with builders benefiting from low inventory and also from mortgage rates softening just a bit. Well, as we head into a pivotal season for home buying, analysts remaining largely bullish on home improvement stocks, Mizuho initiating coverage on both Lowe's and Home Depot with buy ratings, naming Lowe's a top pick. For more on this, we want to bring in David Bellinger. He is Mizuho's America's director and senior analyst. It's great to have you here. So let's start with Lowe's being a top pick within your coverage base right now. What is it about Lowe's that you think better positions that name versus Home Depot, which you also see uh, upside with? Good morning, and thanks for having me on. So yes, we, we do like the home improvement space. We are beginning to see some green shoots in these housing numbers, somewhat better housing activity. But we step back and look at Lowe's versus Home Depot. We clearly like both names, but we prefer Lowe's as our top pick within our consumer hard lines coverage and our top pick overall. And what we like here, most especially for Lowe's, is that they've got this bigger do-it-yourself piece of the business. It's about 75% of sales. Home Depot's at about 50%. And we think that gives Lowe's better leverage to any early turns in existing home sales. So any homeowner knows once you buy a house, you're typically in these stores every weekend, <laughs> two or three years, constantly fixing projects. So Lowe's over indexes in those categories like paint, outdoor, you know, patio, seasonal categories. So we think that gives Lowe's a bit of a leg up. We expect comp sales to turn positive towards the back half of this year. If, if we don't see what has been dubbed as the, I think, silver tsunami where there's a wave of um, baby boomer homeowners that don't list their properties because they want to just sit on that for a little longer and wait for uh, the environment to emerge where they're seeing multiple and, and dozens of bids start to come in on a property. If we don't see that come forward, what does that then mean for the amount of buyers that may say, you know what, I'll just go look for a potential new home build out instead and how that could translate through to Home Depot and Lowe's? Yeah, good question. And then there's no doubt there's been sort of a freeze on housing activity over the past 12 to 24 months. And I, I think the homeowner or the potential homeowner is looking to get in at, at a good price. And, and whether that's existing home sales, new home sales, I, I think there's a lot of demand out there. We looked at a lot of data. We looked at Google Trends data. And it seems like demand for housing is almost at you know peak 2021 type levels. Mm. So we think there's a lot of demand on the sidelines ready to be unlocked. If we get lower rates, that's a nice added accelerant. Mm. But if we also look at just the longer term demand dynamics for home improvement, one key stat, about 50% of the US housing stock right now is aged 40 or older. And these homes tend to be you know, leaky buckets. There's always some kind of maintenance activity you have to put in place. And we, we projected this number out over the next several decades, and that 50% is steadily moving up towards about 65% by 2050. So you, you've got a long tailwind of just older houses, potential remodeling, remodeling activity. And we do see a potential for this sort of renovation renaissance or renovation boom coming over the next several decades. And Home Depot and Lowe's, they're positioning their businesses for this. They're going after the big complex pro and that will lead them to have what I view as a pretty elevated sales base for years and years to come. David, if we do see the Fed uh, delay potentially its first rate cut even further than what the market is pricing in right now, is that going to then have that ripple effect and delay this turnaround or boost that you're expecting to see within that within housing activity? Potentially, yes. And I would say that our estimates and our thesis on both of these stocks, we don't necessarily bake in rate cuts yeah. before the year ends. You know, and that's in line with our Mizuho macro view. And we, we spent a lot of time studying this post-pandemic, post-stimulus digestion period, right? Home Depot and Lowe's saw an, an enormous acceleration in their business. You know, if you're talking about a low to mid single digit comp sales number is good for them. There are some months in 2020 where these companies were comping 30, 40%. And that, that's just unheard of for companies with north of $100 billion sales base. So we, we spent a lot of time studying this. We think we're at the, the tail end of this digestion period, and even absent, you know, these rate cuts that you know some people are expecting throughout the year, we, we don't necessarily see that. But as Lowe's and Home Depot lap some of these, you know, easier comparisons that turned south towards the back half of last year, I think if demand stays where it is, you're you're getting back to flattish, potentially slightly positive 
low single digit type comp sales. And that'll give us a better runway into 2025, especially if we do have a, a more forceful rate cut activity going into next year. You have a really extensive and an interesting coverage list here. I mean, any coverage list that includes Stitch Fix as well as Mr. Car Wash absolutely catches my attention. But and Mr. Car Wash is one of your top picks right now. But I want to focus in specifically on Wayfair. Where in this broader kind of homes landscape and where Wayfair fits in to potential home buyers or even the um, the, the renaissance that you were talking about, the renovation renaissance that we could see. Where does Wayfair get its legs? Yeah, absolutely. And our, our coverage is built to follow the connected consumer and this next wave of digital spending. Who doesn't love a good car wash? But Wayfair does fit in here. This is sort of a secondary call on home improvement, on housing getting better. So, so Wayfair, we did a very similar digestion phase analysis. We're starting to see some positive inflection in US-based order growth. So the numbers are starting to inflect slightly positive. Wayfair actually had their first year-over-year -year positive growth number for active customers last quarter, and that was the first time since Q3 of 21. So, so I think we're getting there. And I, I don't think the market is fully appreciating a much leaner Wayfair model now. This, this company clearly overhired through 2020 and 2021. They've cut back somewhere between 20 and 25 percent of their headcount. And they've pulled out about $2 billion in annualized costs out of the model. So if you do get stabilizing to slightly positive revenue growth into next year, I think you're going to see a rapid profitability improvement for Wayfair. There's bears who will argue that this company might not be structurally profitable. We've, we very much disagree with that. And we see them getting to about a mid-single-digit EBITDA margin this year. They've got a path to get to 10% over the long term. That might be three, five years away. But I think if we see stabilizing revenues to slightly positive revenue growth in 2024 and after, you know, this stock has a lot of upside to it. David, great to have you on here with us today. We know that you've got a lot of companies to keep tabs on, including Five Below later on after the bell. We'll be checking back in in the future. Appreciate the time. David Bellinger, who is the Mizuho America's Director and Senior Analyst. Thanks so much. You got it. Well, cash bonuses fell across Wall Street during a challenging 2023, but for some top executives, they were able to buck the trend. Here with the details, we've got Yahoo Finance's David Hollerith. David, what did you find in the millions and the billions of dollars range for some of these executives? Yeah, so Brad, you know, uh, recent filings have shown us um, that cash bonuses, uh, despite uh, the New York comptroller finding that on average, cash bonuses on Wall Street fell uh, two percent last year. Um, cash bonuses for uh, CEOs of major Wall Street banks that includes uh, CEOs of Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, Citigroup, and Wells Fargo all actually rose. Um, now, this is interesting for a lot of reasons. Uh, one, I think, is just to point out that I, I think people forget sometimes that the actual uh, Wall Street bonuses do come back to the state and city via tax revenues. So this is something they pay attention to and watch. But one reason why the average might have fallen last year, uh, the comptroller cited yesterday talking to us, was uh, market volatility and then also um, the amount of younger workers who have actually joined the securities industry last year. So those are two reasons that are brought up. And again, more younger workers joining the industry is overall not a bad thing, um, but it's obviously a stark contrast to the amount of uh, salary that the CEOs of the big banks have. That being said, you know, compensation for them is always based around different kinds of things. It's not necessarily just how deals are going. But on that note, you know, the big story of last year that we've talked about a lot has been this investment banking slump. Um, and what's interesting here now is that um, the investment banking slump, slump it looks like, uh, could have a revival. That means, you know, a revival in the IPO market and also in mergers and acquisitions. And, you know, it's important to watch not just because the sig it signals um, how Wall Street firms are doing and also, you know, how morale is for those employees, but also what tax revenues are going to look like for New York State and city. Now, the comptroller told us that they had actually estimated uh, greater declines in the average bonuses from last year. 
And because of that, they're not, there's not going to be a negative drag on the overall budget. But it all comes back to just why the revival in investment banking is really important this year. And we have been seeing some signs. It also comes takes us back to today and why it's so important with the Fed, not so much about whether or not there are cuts, but whether or not there's certainty in the economy. David, thanks so much for digging into the numbers here, laying this out for us. Really appreciate it. Yahoo Finance's own David Hollerith. See you soon. Guys, coming up, NVIDIA announced a slew of new partnerships at its GTC conference on Monday. We'll talk to an executive from one of those companies, Cadence Design Systems, next. Artificial intelligence powerhouse NVIDIA announcing a slew of strategic partnerships at its GTC conference on Monday afternoon as it looks to scale AI development across industries. Software company Cadence Design Systems is one of those names now expanding its relationship with NVIDIA and shares of Cadence rising following the news. Joining us live from the GTC conference in San Jose, California is Nimish Modi, who is the Cadence Design Systems Senior Vice President and General Manager of Strategy and New Ventures. Nimish, thanks so much for taking the time. We see in the background that you're, you're still out there. You're in these streets discussing AI chip technology and, and how NVIDIA is going to partner with Cadence here. What should investors expect as a result of this partnership? Hi, good morning. Thanks for inviting me. And yes, it's just the beginning of the third day over here and uh, beginning to fill up over here. So. Uh, you know, I think we are really excited about our partnership with Cadence. You know, Cadence and NVIDIA have been uh, partnering for a long time across a wide range 
of uh, areas, and we've collaborated for well over a decade. Uh, you know, we are proud that uh, NVIDIA extensively uses our chip design and verification tools, are increasing their system design and simulation tools to realize their, uh, you know, trailblazing AI designs. And effectively, our tools create a digital twin, um, you know, of the design so engineers can, um, you know, simulate the design, make sure it does what it's supposed to do before uh, committing it to, to silicon. And, um, you know, as Jensen said, digital twins are set to really transform multiple industries. And so one of the announcements we made uh, you know, yesterday was to extend a collaboration to um, the data center, digital twins for data centers. And over here, we are integrating our reality uh, data center digital twin platform with uh, NVIDIA Omniverse, and that will, you know, greatly optimize energy efficiency. And then another announcement we made, which is very exciting, is in the medicine or life sciences uh, field, where uh, we are integrating NVIDIA's uh, generative AI bio Nemo platform with our Orion molecular design platform to accelerate drug discovery. Yeah, Namesh, going off of that and the partnership, the partnerships that you have had uh, with NVIDIA in the past, th what was announced this week, though? Just talk to us about how that is really going to significantly help AI expand its footprint, expand adoption, and what you see that just in terms of being that long-term payout, long-term benefit uh, for Caden specifically. Yeah, so I think, you know, AI overall is creating a massive explosion of mm -hmm. data. And, and it's, it's uh, driving a massive demand for high density, high performance compute and, and more data centers. I mean, there is, uh, uh, you know, some industry data which, uh, which says about three to 4% of the global electricity is consumed by data centers and that's expected to grow significantly. So by, uh, through this collaboration that we have with, uh, with NVIDIA on the specific front, uh, you know, we are uh, integrating, as I said, a reality, um, you know, digital twin uh, data center platform with, uh, with uh, NVIDIA's Omniverse. And that drives, we virtualize the entire data center, you know, and, and then you can optimize the design and the, uh, the operations of the data center through a combination of AI, HPC, physics-based modeling and improve data, uh, uh, sorry, energy efficiency by uh, uh, 30%. And then with Omniverse, you know, you can get a, a 30X improvement in the design and simulation workflows. So this is just one example of the partnership that we have. It's a very broad uh, ranging partnership. And uh, you know, recently we announced some Millennium uh, M1 supercomputing CFD platform, which is co-optimized with NVIDIA's technology. And then life sciences is the future. I think there's a lot of exciting opportunities over there. And there too, we announced a partnership uh, on the generative AI um, you know, bio platform as well. Nimish, I'm glad that you mentioned this reality digital twin platform. I was trying to wrap my head around that earlier today here uh, and, and ultimately try to figure out for myself and for other patients out there when, as a result of generative AI, will we see a clear difference in the patient experience? Right, so the Reality Digital Twin platform is for data centers. Uh, I think what you're referring to is our uh, integration on their generative bio Nemo platform with our Orion Molecular Design, um, you know, SaaS platform. So over here, uh, you know, that integration is uh, very exciting because it, uh, it uh, opens up, you know, new vistas of opportunities for exploring that massive, you know, chemical space and identifying high quality compounds uh, sooner and, and getting to the trusted results very quickly. So, you know, there's a lot of investment in R&D on the pharma side, $250 billion worth of investments, you know, on an annual basis. And then the percentage of, uh, you know, successes are very low. So in this, by, by this partnership and using the power of AI, power of high performance compute, power of these algorithms with the molecular design platforms we have, we, we uh, are looking at, you know, really accelerating that whole process, uh, you know, significantly. I'm curious to get your perspective since you have been a partner uh, with NVIDIA now for some time. The tone of the conference this year, the type of conversations that you have been having this week, how does that compare to the conversations that you've had in the past? And where does that tell us or what does that tell us about where we are in the phase of AI just in terms of the early beginnings still? Oh, I think I think this. Uh, the, you know, we are standing right now at the cusp of a of a revolution. I think you know AI is just causing such a transform transformative effect across every industry, you know, society, and 
and humankind has got the potential for that. And uh, you know, uh, I, you know, we cadence from a cadence perspective, what we've been doing is incorporating AI technologies in all our tools. We have you know introduced several new transformative generative AI applications, and then marquee customers like Nvidia depend upon our tools to help them realize you know their uh, their designs uh, in a much more productive manner with much higher performance, lower power, and and the like. And so I think you know like I said, we've had a very long partnership and collaboration with Nvidia over the years, and and now with AI at the center of all of that, I think we are just moving into the next phase. Uh, you know. Of, uh, of innovation, and we are really excited uh, to be partnering with them to get, uh, you know, to realize the full potential of what AI can bring uh, to the world. And, and with partnerships that you've had with NVIDIA, partnerships NVIDIA has with other major blue chip companies in some instances and, and pioneers across industries, is, is NVIDIA securing its own position as, as the de facto must call um, type of solution or platform or company in order to really enable and unlock that next kind of wave of growth for a company like Cadence or a, a company like, you know, Microsoft and, and all of these other partners that they've been able to bring on. Yeah, I think from a from a, uh, a cadence perspective, I think you know our tools are are essential, you know, for chip design, for system design, and now increasingly moving into you know uh, innovation into into uh, life sciences um, as well. So I think we work very closely, you know, with Nvidia, with a partnership with the foundry partners, with the IP partners like ARM, and uh, you know, and, and other ecosystem partners, and uh, we we have a broad portfolio across chip design, chip verification systems system design, system simulation, moving into, into molecular design. Um, and, uh, you know, with, uh, you know, working very closely with these partners, we're in a position where we can help them accelerate their, their uh, you know, innovation on the next generation, uh, latest geometry, you know, semiconductor chips, as well as on uh, on uh, system design and verification across multiple industries. I mean, we are we we traverse. You know, our customers are in mobile, in aerospace, and automotive. Uh, you know, just to name a, a few. And uh, you know, we are as I said, we are really really looking forward to working even more closely with uh, with Nvidia because I think this confluence of AI of uh, uh, high performance compute uh, and twin sequence twin simulation or digital twins coming together. I think it's a unique moment in time, which is going to is going to be pervasive. And uh, you know, semiconductors are seminal to all of that, and we are seminal to the semiconductor industry. Nimish, thank you so much for taking the time. Stay hydrated out there. I, I, I'm, I'm only guessing what some of the parties, some of the events may have looked like. There's a lot to celebrate with this newest renaissance and, and revolution that AI could be bringing forward here. Don't party too hard. Nimish Modi, who is the Cadence Design System Senior Vice President and General Manager of Strategy and New Ventures. Thanks so much for taking the thank time. Thank you very much. Thank okay. you. Coming up, we'll turn to the retail sector. Amazon's big spring sale, as they call it, begins what it means for the company after this break.
Yahoo Finance is Wealth is your guide, your group of advisors, planners, and jargon busters to help you save, build, and grow your money. How do I know if I'm saving enough for retirement? How do I know if it's right for me to go on that lavish vacation? Is it finally time to refinance my mortgage? How do I pay less in taxes? We'll get you the answers you need. Well, earning it, growing it, and managing it. It's more than tracking just the latest market moves. It's more than your favorite trending tickers. One does not simply build wealth without considering the entire financial landscape. It takes a community, and we've built one for you. Wealth cuts through the noise to help guide your financial decisions so that your money works for you. Wealth on Yahoo Finance premieres March 25th. We are just under one week out from the launch of Wealth here on Yahoo Finance, our brand new show that we're airing daily between 11 and 12 p.m. Eastern time, now dedicated to personal finance, hosted by the one and only Bradley Smith. Brad, we've told viewers what to expect from the next, from the first couple of segments. What could they expect after that, I guess? Uh, well, the middle of the show, or the C block, as we call it in the biz, will be dedicated to your financial futures. There are so many events that people need to plan ahead for, and we're going to help you do it. Prime example here, Shauna. Why you need to think about the cost of your kids' education, even if you're only in your 20s. My goodness, I wish I had started at that age. Anyway, we're having the conversation now. And what are the other financial milestones you should be thinking about in your 30s, 40s, and 50s? Should you be saving now for that six-month cruise around the world that you want to take with the partner that you have or are currently swiping for or one of the, on one of the apps? We'll have it all from a financial planning advice and the best tips and tricks perspective to build your wealth. So tune in for the premiere of Wealth. That is 11 a.m. Eastern time, of course, Monday, March 25th. Tell me, am I taking the trip? Take the trip. Yeah, right? Just take the trip. Yeah. I mean, it You're doesn't have to be like a massive trip, yeah. right? You like cruises. Do I? I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I'm always down for know. a vacation, so it depends. As long as it's not too expensive. Cruises can look different in many no. different forms. You could uh, you could be on a major vessel, or you could be in a fishing boat. <laughs> All right, guys. You're right here on. Yeah, we look forward to that. So I love fishing. Off month, uh, love fishing, <laughs> love building wealth, and love knowing what to do with our money and getting wealth kicking off Yahoo Finance next week on Monday, 11 a.m. Eastern Time. But keep right here on Yahoo Finance for now. We've got much more of your market action ahead. Again, you're looking at the Dow up just above the flat line. S&P and NASDAQ, though, trading to the downside. We'll be right back.
The price of Bitcoin has no shortage of catalysts from the debate around regulation to whether it's a security or a commodity and whether or not it really is digital gold. But one event is undeniable and its impact on the world's most premier digital asset, the halving. Every four years, the reward for mining the biggest cryptocurrency is cut in half. This happens in order to reduce the amount of coins in circulation. How is it calculated? Well, it happens specifically every time 210,000 blocks are mined. We can calculate the date fairly precisely with the knowledge that the average block time for Bitcoin mining is around 10 minutes. That calculation gets us very close to four years. Why is it needed? Because there's only so much Bitcoin available, 21 million to be exact. And like any other cryptocurrency, it needs to remain scarce to hold its value. So how often does this happen? Well, the halving takes place every four years. The first in 2012 decreased the award for creating a new block from 50 to 25 Bitcoin. The second halving in 2016, that lowered the reward further from 25 Bitcoin to 12 and a half Bitcoin. Last time out, 2020. And you guessed it, we halved again. The block award dropping to 6.25 Bitcoin. So, there's nothing wrong with your math here. This time around, the block reward miners will receive half, 3.125 Bitcoin. The big question, of course, what happens to the price? Now, the moves could be significant. In the past, we've seen Bitcoin rise after a halving event, though there's no certainty that this will always be the outcome. The other key focus is the outcome for the miners. The rewards that they're generating will, of course, diminish, and that's not great for an industry with a very high cost burden. Keep an eye on how the big publicly listed miners, the likes of Marathon and Riot, manage this event. As ever, talks of consolidation will no doubt do the rounds. No matter how you look at it, the event will have serious consequences for all crypto stakeholders and will be across all of the developments here at Yahoo Finance. Amazon going on the offensive with its first ever new spring sale. The retail giant doing everything it can to regain some of that lost momentum within its retail business. It's also facing some stiff competition from Chinese rivals Timu and Xi'an. So they're launching this event. It's going to be a couple of days. A couple of things to point out here, Brad. Yes, it's good news if you're a loyal Amazon shopper like myself, a Prime member. But if you're not a Prime member like you, you're actually able to like participate huh, yeah. in this Amazon sale, which yeah. is unlike Prime Day sales or Prime sales in the past, so it runs the 20th through the 25th. But the reason that they're doing this is why we're talking about it, right? Because we know Amazon's retail business has been struggling to regain some of that lost momentum. Consumers under pressure, not only here in the U.S., but around the world from higher inflation. That has clearly weighed on their business. They're also facing some tougher competition when it comes to Timu, when it comes to Shein, some of those lower priced offerings, they are starting to creep in and claim some of that market share here. So Amazon could be potentially looking to more sales in the future in order to recapture and also expand the current market share right now. How big of a driver it's going to be to the bottom line? Not a big difference, I don't think. I wonder if this extends into Whole Foods items because this that would, that, nice. that would make me a buyer for yeah. sure. But as of right now, it doesn't seem like an event that's going to make me sign up for a Prime membership. That's just me. I am, you don't have to for this event. I don't have to for this event, and I still... But it's not even just signing up for a Prime membership. I just don't purchase on the site, Prime membership or not. So you're maybe... Out. You're spending a lot more time hitting the stories than uh, you need to I be. I mean, I'm getting my steps in. I'm closing my rings. You know, you got to do that on a daily basis. I get upset when my Apple Watch yells at me, shames me for not closing mm -hmm. my rings. Mm -hmm. and there's a pretty good deal on some pickleball paddles, though, here. So I might take a look Ooh, at that. Ooh, I got to check that out, too. All right. Well, we got to leave it there. But keep right here on Yahoo Finance. Rochelle and Nikiko, they've got you for the next hour. We'll see you tomorrow.
Welcome to Yahoo Finance. It's 11 a.m. on the East Coast, 8 a.m. on the West. I'm Rochelle Akufo alongside Akiko Fujita. Here's a look at what I'm watching this morning. It's decision day for the Federal Reserve. Markets bracing for remarks from Fed Chair Powell on the path for rate cuts ahead. We'll dive into what investors should keep an ear out for. Bitcoin's gains pulling back here. Bitcoin shedding billions of dollars in value since its record high last week. What's driving the reversal? We're going to have a breakdown later this hour. And a milestone moment for Intel. The White House granting Intel up to $8.5 billion in funding through the Chips Act. More ahead on what this means for the chipmaker coming up. First, though, let's take a look at where markets are trading. We are 90 minutes into the trading day on this Fed decision day and a bit of a holding pattern here for investors as they keep a close watch on what, what Fed Chair Jay Powell is set to say later this afternoon. The Dow up 34 points, the S&P 500 trading flat and the Nasdaq down just slightly. Let's take a look at Treasury markets. As always, we are seeing all the yields here across the curve pulling back. The 10-year yield at 4.29 percent and the 30-year yield at 4.29 while well, the Federal Reserve is widely expected to hold interest rates steady today, at markets are pricing in a rate cut in June. We saw inflation remain sticky in the first two months of the year. The question is, how realistic is that June cut bet? Let's bring in Yahoo Finance's Jen Schomburger, as always, keeping a track on all things Fed. Uh, what are we expecting today, Jen? Hey there, Akigo. Yeah, as far as the timing of a June rate cut and whether that's still on the table, look, I think it's still possible. Because if you look at the hotter inflation readings that we've been seeing over the past couple of months and in, in the early part of this year, much of it has been based on the consumer price index, which is more highly levered to housing. And housing, as you know, has been very sticky and slow to come down. If you contrast that with the Fed's preferred inflation gauge on core PCE, core PCE has actually been steadily coming down by a tenth of a percent every single month. In January, it was at 2.8 percent. And so if that trend continues, we will be at 2.4 percent on inflation by June, which, by the way, is the inflation expectation that the Fed penciled in back in December. Of course, that could change this afternoon. But nevertheless, Fed Chair Powell has said that the Fed will begin cutting rates well before inflation gets back to 2%. And I just also want to add that last week I spoke with former St. Louis Fed President Jim Bullard, and he told me there's this implicit range uh, for core PCE of two and a half to one and a half percent. So if they're at 2.4 by June, well, they're there in the range. So with that in mind, then we know that the 2% the inflation target gets all the attention as well as the unemployment rate. But what are you expecting to hear about the Fed's balance sheet? Yeah, Rochelle, I'm not expecting any major announcement from the Fed to the effect of, hey, we're going to cap uh, Treasury and mortgage-backed security runoffs at you know some certain lower level at this point. But Fed Chair Powell did say that the committee is going to discuss some sort of strategy to try to coalesce how they will eventually begin to slow tapering this balance sheet runoff and eventually stop it. So I am looking for any uh, insight as to what the committee did discuss and whether there's more color around the parameters for what they would use to begin slowing down that balance sheet runoff. Recall that Dallas Fed Chair, uh, excuse me, Dallas Fed President Lori Logan, who used to be at the New York Fed and oversaw the last wind down of the balance sheet runoff where there was a hiccup in 2019, she has warned that the Fed really needs to be more cautious this time around to avoid any volatility in financial markets and money market funds. So she's argued for slowing sooner rather than later. I'm curious to see whether the committee agrees with her on that. We shall certainly see and be keeping a close eye on that dot plot, of course. Our very own Jennifer Schonberger, appreciate you joining us this morning. And stay with us on Yahoo Finance later this afternoon. We will have that, that, um, that press conference from Fed J. Powell later on. Well, stocks are essentially flat this morning after the S&P 500 hit a fresh record high on Tuesday. Traders eagerly await the Fed's rate decision and forecast as they wrap up this week's meeting. Now, investors continue to bet on a June rate cut, but what will the central bank signal at today's meeting? To break down what we should watch for today, we have Cindy Beaulieu, Conning North America CIO. Thank you for joining us on this Fed Day. Happy Fed Day to all who celebrate it. 
So in terms of the top three things that you're going to be looking out for, not just in, in the announcement here, but also passing through what Fed Chair Powell is going to say at the press conference. Sure. Thanks, Rochelle. So great to be here with you again. And, you know, today is going to be an interesting day. They always are. But our base case is that we don't see any change in the uh, interest rate path for the Fed at this moment. But what we're really keying in on is going to be the SEPs. Is there going to be, and we do expect they may actually touch up that inflation target to be just a little bit higher and the growth target to be just a little bit higher. That combination will send a signal to the market that the Fed is a little bit more concerned about inflation, not running out of control, but stubborn, sticky, and maybe has a little bit of upward pressure built into it at this moment. So that's definitely one of the things. <laughs> the other thing is the balance sheet. We do not think that they will actually come out today and say what they plan to do with the balance sheet, because one of the things that's been interesting as we've heard from Fed governors along the way since the January meeting is there's dissent in the room. There's some concern about when the right time is to start cutting rates, and there's some concern about when the right time is to start moving on the balance sheet. And so it does feel like he's going to have a little bit of trouble building enough consensus today to be able to come out and say that they actually know what they want to do with the balance sheet. And that actually will also signal to the markets another kind of potential easing path. So the Fed is very careful here. The last thing we're looking for is the tone uh, that Chair Powell takes in the statement itself. He was decidedly hawkish in January, especially compared to what he said back in December. But then you listen to his testimony in front of Congress, and it had a softer tone to it. But again, back to that dissension in the room, the others on the committee have actually signaled something that's much closer to the hawkish tone of late. So it does feel like to us that that hawkish tone is probably going to come back through again today. And Cindy, you mentioned uh, that December meeting. Now, the markets read it as dovish when he said that uh, Powell said that he signaled that the risk of under or over tightening is now more balanced. Markets took that as, OK, Cuts are coming. We're looking at five or six. But now as we look potentially for a June rate cut and perhaps two to three for this year, then how aggressive is the Fed going to have to be? And are markets prepared for it? I, I think the, uh, to the, the last point there, markets have been consistently trying to get ahead of the Fed on when these rate cuts are going to happen and how many of them will come. And they've been consistently disappointed. And I think that that's going to continue here because we're still seeing, we, we actually think that June could be off the table and that maybe it is the second half of this year. And in fact, that was our call at the start of this year. So we're watching markets just continue to get disappointed by the Fed and by what they're saying. But we think that that's still not built into where rates sit today. And so it's likely that there will be disappointment today, um, that they are not going to be pleased when they they hear the hawkish tone that pushes rate cuts out further into the year. And by the math itself, if they push out those rate cuts further into the year, we run out of room for them to do a whole lot of them. So I, I think that we are setting ourselves up for some, some disappointment today for the markets. And I think what's really important about the dot plots is, do they bring them down? If they bring them down by one move, do they put that into next year? If they don't put that into next year, that for us is a signal that the Fed is saying 2% might not be the right target anymore. And perhaps they are realizing that the structural changes of COVID, the fiscal spending that we're going through, the changes in population, the reshoring of a lot of industry, all of those things are contributing to an inflation path that doesn't bring us back to 2% any longer. So today could be an interesting day. The tone I think will be really important. Uh, Cindy, what does this all mean from an equities perspective? Are you holding steady on your portfolio? Or are you starting to change things up a bit in anticipation of that rate cut later this year? Sure. You know, for equities, it's been interesting. But I think one of the things that was very noteworthy when <clears throat> Powell took a more uh, dovish tone in December was you could see there was that pent up risk taking that people really wanted to put into their portfolios, bigger equity positions, be more comfortable taking on risk across all markets. And so I think that that, while this particular Fed doesn't focus quite as much on what markets do, prior chairmen certainly have, uh, but this particular Fed is more focused on the economy, but still they know that if they send the signal that they are getting closer to easing policy, that there seems to be a lot of pent up demand to put on more risk. And so we would have to expect that if he does take that dovish tone again today, 
then you would expect equity markets to probably react pretty favorably to that because it means that the fear of the Fed keeping rates too high for too long and tanking the economy is less likely. And therefore, the growth picture is better. And for equities, that's you know a, a key point. So there is reason to, if, if you believe that the Fed will be more dovish, there's reason to be more bullish on equities. But that hawkish tone, like I said, is what we think is more likely today. And so it's probably a good time to be a little bit more cautious and kind of hold equities at current levels. And, and Cindy, with that stickier inflation picture also comes a softening but still resilient labor market, consumers still spending, albeit more cautiously, and then starting to see commodities ticking back up as well. For investors who, who would like to take a longer view here and not really get rattled by what the, the market, how the market might react today off the press conference, what should they keep in mind? No, that's a great question. And I think it gets back to some of the things you just mentioned. As you look at the economy, there are signs that it is decelerating. As you look at the consumer, there are signs that they are starting to pull back a little bit. But we still have a strong labor market. We still have solid wage growth. And so that combination is allowing the consumer to extend beyond what we would be used to at this point in a cycle. And so if you're looking at things longer term and then getting back to some of the other parts that build into inflation, you have to think that rates need to be higher from here. Not, not terribly higher, but a little bit higher. So I think you can slowly add duration in this period and look out longer that the credit cycle is in a pretty good spot that interest rates will probably move a little bit higher here, but that spreads also can stay pretty much in check if we can maintain this picture of stable but slightly slowing growth, a pretty decent labor market, and a consumer that seems to be able to manage all of this. Cindy Bolu, Conning North America CIO. It's good to talk to you today. Appreciate the time. Nice to talk with you as well, Kika. All your markets action ahead. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance.
Well, Bitcoin gaining back some of its earlier losses from the morning, hovering just over $64,000 after demand for spot Bitcoin ETFs faltered, sending the cryptocurrency to a two-week low. Joining us now is our very own David Hollerith. I mean, a two-week low, David, but we're talking about record highs in between, so not necessarily a bad level, right? Is this just kind of a healthy pullback? Yeah, I mean, um, uh, Kiko, to your point, it's been about a year and a half since we've seen a daily drop of this size in Bitcoin. Um, but that's that being said, it is um, pretty common, um, or not common, I should say, it happens to Bitcoin usually per year. In 2020, we saw a drop greater in this of this magnitude, um, over 8%, um, three different times in 2021 and 2022, both two very different kind of markets for the asset. Um, we, we saw seven days that had greater daily drops than what we saw yesterday for each of those years. So uh, this does happen. It's, it's not super common. Um, and I think if we look at market data, what it shows us um, is that there was some pretty heavy outflows from the Grayscale Bitcoin Trust ETF. And then on top of that, there's a lot of leverage that's been building up in the system <clears throat> since the beginning of the year. So I think if you take all that together, kind of it does seem to make sense what happened to see what happened. I, another thing that's interesting is that Bitcoin has been... Uh, fairly less correlated this year compared to other other as, other years. And we're going to want to see what's going on, what's said at the uh, Fed press conference today to see if there's any kind of reaction or if crypto continues to kind of have, do its uncorrelated thing. So that's sort of the next place people are watching. And David, it's interesting because usually in the run up to Bitcoin halving, we tend to see Bitcoin prices spike. But when you add in this wrinkle then of spot Bitcoin ETFs as well, and some people who have been holding on as long as they can and saw, you know, that hit 73,000 were like, that's it, I can't take anymore. How much of that is playing into some of the price action that we're seeing? I mean, Rochelle, you bring up a great point, which is that um, in the past, people are always, always talk about um, Bitcoin rally periods. And it usually has to do with coming, you know, um, in the past, we look at the past cycles after uh, the, the Bitcoin halving, which happens at the end of April this year. Um, and we're seeing this whole rally happen before that. So uh, it is kind of uncharted territory. I mean, Bitcoin is, is, a, is a fairly new asset. So a lot of it is uncharted territory. Uh, but, you know, I, I, I think what people are mainly looking at is what the ETF flows can tell us. And they are pretty helpful in terms of understanding just what is going on in the market. And on that note, um, you know, uh, Bloomberg Intelligence, who's been pretty on the uh, the uh, crypto ETF calls, came out today saying that they saw the Ethereum ETF, which is also expected this year, uh, had less favorable odds than the Bitcoin ETF. They gave that a sort of 25% chance of, of happening. And that's obviously at the forefront of investor minds also. All right. Well, we'll continue to watch and expect the volatility around Bitcoin. David Hollerith, as always, thanks so much for that. Well, the U.S. is set to award Intel up to eight and a half billion dollars for chip manufacturing as part of the Chips in Sciences Act. Intel CEO Pat Gelsinger saying the support will help keep Intel and the U.S. at the forefront of the AI era. And Rochelle, we've been watching um, reaction in sh the markets, uh, shares of Intel, not necessarily getting a significant bump, largely because Intel was expected to be the biggest beneficiary of the CHIPS Act. I mean, a few thoughts on this. You think about when the CHIPS Act was passed, that was 2021. Number one, that tells you how long these things take in terms of the government being able to set aside and um, allocate these grants. Eight and a half billion dollars in, in addition to that, eleven billion dollars in loans. But Intel is looking to spend a hundred billion dollars over the next five years to bring manufacturing back to the U.S. and build out its fab facility. So yes, this is a significant milestone for Intel. They're going to need the money, uh, but there's still a lot of questions about whether they can, in fact, build this out in a timely manner to meet the market demand. It's true. I mean, when you think of the pace of how quickly things are moving, especially on the heels of the NVIDIA conference, people aren't wasting time when it comes to the development of these chips, given, you know, the dominance in the market by Taiwan Semiconductor and others. But interesting to see when you look at some of these numbers, the scale of these investments, Intel just alone, as you mentioned, they're planning a $100 billion spending spree across four states, including almost $20 billion in federal grants and loans, and wants to secure another $25 billion 
in tax breaks. It's part of Intel's five-year spending plan. Also looking at um, some empty fields in Columbus, Ohio, where CEO Pat Gelsinger said this is going to be the largest AI chip manufacturing site in the world. And that's supposed to be starting in 2027. So when you think about that timeline and already how quickly things have developed in the chip manufacturing space, clearly we knew that Intel was going to be the biggest recipient here of the Chips Act. But it's good to see some of that money. Now we actually see where it's going to be heading. So continue to track that. And as you mentioned there, Intel stock being rewarded, but ever so slightly this morning. Well, looking at another ticker, and, and Rochelle, Tencent you know, we Holdings. We should point out report. the backdrop to all of this. The backdrop to all of this is, of course, that the U.S. produces just 10 percent of the advanced chips or the manufacturing um, of chips. So they're trying to, you know, double that number, uh, which is certainly key. But um, just, you know, sort of worth putting out that cautious voice there that those like TSMC who've been trying to expand in the U.S. Mm. Um, have had to delay plans because of um, concerns around the workforce, too. So. Still a lot of challenges ahead, but a, a positive day for Intel today. Indeed, indeed. We want to shift gears and look at Tencent Holdings reporting its fourth quarter results. And that's despite missing revenue expectations and suffering a slowdown in its gaming business. Looking at shares here, just edging slightly higher after the company plans to more than double its stock buyback program. And this is something we've been continuing to see here with a lot of companies sort of announcing some, some issues when it comes to slowdowns in some of their key industries here and then coupling that with the stock buyback as well to have shore up confidence in terms of the product roadmap ahead of Kiko. Yeah, you're certainly right about that. Um, Tencent, uh, certainly one of those companies that have not just been affected by the slowdown broadly that we've seen in China, but also around investor concerns around regulation in the gaming sector. Remember, Tencent, the largest gaming player here. Um, when you think back to the <clears throat> announcements that were made last year about setting limits on the amount of time that um, gamers can play, but also... Uh, the number of awards, essentially, that would be limited there. Uh, there was a huge, huge sell-off back in December on the back of that announcement. With Tencent specifically, out of investor concern, this could really affect the revenue picture. Tencent reassuring investors today on the call that that's not necessarily the case, that they think that this is actually a positive, whether that's a spin or not. <clears throat> we are seeing Tencent shares bouncing back there about 1%. Indeed. And they talked about some of that gaming revenue, announced some new games coming up in the pipeline as well. But obviously, a lot of people did buy, inve buy and invest in a lot of these games during COVID, haven't really felt the need to keep splashing out on some of these games. So we'll continue to keep an eye on that gaming market and what we see from Tencent. All right, well, do stay with us. We have all your markets action still ahead. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance. Yahoo Finance is well is your guide, your group of advisors, planners, and jargon busters to help you save, build, and grow your money. How do I know if I'm saving enough for retirement? How do I know if it's right for me to go on that lavish vacation? Is it finally time to refinance my mortgage? How do I pay less in taxes? We'll get you the answers you need. Wealth, earning it, growing it, and managing it. It's more than tracking just the latest market moves. It's more than your favorite trending tickers. One does not simply build wealth without considering the entire financial landscape. It takes a community and we've built one for you. Wealth cuts through the noise to help guide your financial decisions so that your money works for you. Wealth on Yahoo Finance premieres March 25th.
The world's biggest leaders and experts in the energy industry are in Houston this week discussing the industry's biggest goals and challenges. It's all part of the 42nd annual gathering of SARA Week, the world's preeminent energy conference hosted by S&P Global. Now, we've heard from quite a few industry leaders on our show this week. Our next guest is in Houston now for the conference. We've got Kate Height, Bain and Company partner and energy policy expert. Um, Kate, you know, this conference comes at a time where uh, you sort of get the sense that Yes, companies are still investing in this clean energy transition, but it's not as top of mind maybe as it was a few years ago, partly because the shareholder pressure has eased back. What's your takeaway so far in the conversations that you've been having? I think right now we're in the middle of companies actually trying to sort out what it looks like to invest in this environment. We The time of pledges has passed and we're now in the middle of the heart of implementation. So I think the direction of travel continues to be clear in terms of investment in new energy technologies. It's just the pace that's a little bit uncertain. And sort of that's what we see showing up in the survey that we recently did of about 600 executives on the topic. And Kate, speaking of uh, speaking up that research, in terms of the return on investment, we're, we're still seeing companies wanting to invest here, but some caution here about how what, how they're viewing ROI. What are you see, seeing from some of these companies and where are they seeing the greatest ROI? So I think we're seeing a time of you know, increasing interest rates really impacting the ability to put capital to work in this area right now. So I think there's a lot of sort of capital on the sidelines waiting for those rates to come down so it can really take off. So I do think it's a matter of time frame rather than a pause in the, the theory of the investability of it all. Um, right now, what we're hearing from executives is really the greatest obstacle to scaling up these businesses right now is, as you said, returns compared to what they're getting from conventional fuels, but also customer willingness to pay here, um, really finding those customers who are willing to pay or policy that is you know, enabling um, sort of covering the spread, that green premium, to enable these technologies to take off at, in a scaled way. So I do think it's a matter of timing here, um, but right now we do see some caution given the interest rate environment. Uh, Kate, we did get um, the SEC finalizing those climate disclosure rules a, a few weeks ago. Um, scope 3 not necessarily included in that, and that is, of course, downstream emissions. That is, by the way, makes up the largest chunk of most companies and their emissions output. Um, do, do you get the sense that companies are, I guess the question is, what is the conversation that you're having with companies around this? How much they're going to have to invest? Do they have the infrastructure in place to be able to meet these disclosure rules? And the fact that Scope 3 was omitted, is that on their end, when they don't necessarily have the investments up front, is that seen as a positive, even if it's not a good a positive for climate? So I think companies have been organizing against this for a while. I mean, many of the largest companies in the world have been reporting some of this information voluntarily, in any case, to this to CDP, formerly known as the Climate Disclosure Project. So they are developing some expertise. However, there have been some who have not really gotten into the game. So I think as we look at the SEC regulations and regulations in Europe and in some parts of Asia right now, again, the direction of travel is clear there. A lot of these companies are also international companies. So even though scope three may not be a requirement in the US, it certainly is in Europe and in some of these other geographies as well. So what we see happening right now is companies really mobilizing for compliance. So getting the software as a service providers in place, making sure they have good tracking within their company to really get that granularity on emissions. But where we're most interested in talking to companies is really the climate risk part of some of these disclosures. So this is not just about physical risk, sort of where your operations are happening or where you may consider investment in the future, but it's also about what we call transition risk. So what, how is the regulatory environment gonna shape up? What are some of the big changes and sort of durable um, weather patterns that are gonna influence the performance of your transmission infrastructure, for example? So I do think that the standardization of disclosure is going to be a very positive thing for investors because Prior to this, we really didn't have kind of comparable metrics to think about how companies are performing on this. And I really do appreciate the focus on carbon because that's really where we see um, most investors being the most focused on wanting to see progress. And so, Kate, um, from this research, it showed that executives from every region ranked North America as a more attractive region for investment than Europe, and that included executives within Europe. So despite some of the, the policy and regulation issues, 
Why do you think they're so drawn to, to North America, especially given that we do have a presidential election this year, which could change some of the dynamics? I think there are a couple of reasons. Um, so first, the Inflation Reduction Act and the, the number of different um, infrastructure policies in place in the U.S. right now are really providing a pretty impressive stimulus on the supply side to get some of those new energies out there. Um, so that's one reason. Second is we have an extremely low price of natural gas um, right now in the U.S. as an input. So I think those things are a, are a bit in balance right now, um, as many of the companies who are here at Sierra Week are in, continuing to invest in deployment of conventional resources, but also really looking at energy transition technologies. I think something in the U.S. that's going to be really interesting to follow um, over the next several years is really how we consider stimulating the demand side of all of this new supply that's coming online. And a lot of the interesting discussions we're having here around things like hydrogen, right, are, okay, there are a number of investors who are very interested and willing to invest in building out that supply chain, but where is the offtake going to be? I think that's going to be an interesting tension um, to resolve in the U.S. in the next few years. And Kate, one of the things of note is AI being seen as a difference maker. How do you see that being deployed here? So AI certainly is the, the topic of the moment. I mean, it was at Davos as well. Um, I think that right now, energy executives are really thinking about how to use AI and sort of its predecessor machine learning on improving maintenance and production and supply chain. Um, not quite so sure yet um, what some of those applications are going to be for emissions reductions. But I think that as we see adoption of this new technology increase over time in terms of ability to exploit resources and think of new areas to generate wind power, for example, I think we're going to see more and more different sorts of adoption. Um, and I think that's what's exciting about the technology. So um, I hear it being called a game changer. It may be. Right now, we're definitely in a test and learn phase, and there's certainly a lot of excitement around it. Indeed. Test and learn, show and prove, uh, always the case with AI. Appreciate you taking the time to join us from the conference there. Kate Height, Bain & Company partner and energy policy expert. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, a major win for automakers, but not necessarily climate enthusiasts. The White House is loosening emission rules. This means car makers can build more gas-powered vehicles through 2030 and still meet regulation requirements. To break this down for us, we have Yahoo Finance reporter Pras Subramanian. So, Pras, walk us through this announcement. Well, it's all fairly complicated and in the weeds, so I'm going to kind of keep it a bit simple here. But, but basically, the Department of Energy is kind of easing like those guidelines, like you mentioned, it had for the EV transition, right? Um, how it works. So um, automakers have a thing called CAFE requirements, or the average fuel economy requirements across their fleet. Uh, they were going to go up in 2027 and in 2030. Uh, at the same time, the amount that EVs contributed to the CAFE requirements were going to come down. So you wouldn't get that benefit of selling EVs as much as you do now. Uh, it means automakers would sell a lot more EVs uh, in that time frame. As we know, the EV take rate has been coming down. Consumers have other preferences these days. So the White House and DOE are kind of backing down, listening to automakers, helping them out a little bit by easing in the phasing of these changes to the EV mileage ratings through 2030. So the, the kind of the net effect here is that EVs will probably make up a little bit less than 50% of sales by 2030, as opposed to what the original requirements were, which were over 60%. So this is kind of a big win for automakers. Uh, Pras, how much of this um, has to do with the pressure being placed by car makers on the White House, who said that this transition cannot accelerate um, at the pace that maybe the White House would have liked? How much, of the, how much of this is also about politics in an election year? Yeah, oh yeah, I think it has a, that's a huge factor there. The auto, automakers were definitely uh, pressuring the White House and the DOE on these on these rules. Um, there's the Alliance of Automotive Innovation, which is the big trade group for the automakers. They've been very vocal about how these these changes were too extreme, too far advanced. Uh, it would be too hard for them to do that. And I, and I think you're also kind of seeing the Biden administration looking at what public opinion is on just EVs in general and saying, we should probably back off a little bit. We still want this to happen, but not at the rate that we originally required. And I think some environmentalists like the this, Sierra this Group are not happy about this. But so we'll see how it all uh, how it all shakes out. But as of right now, a good sort of a win for the automakers right now when it comes to that transition. Pras Subramanian is always staying on top of the auto story for us. Thanks so much. Thanks. Well, coming up, we'll dive into some ETF strategies. Why you may consider looking at gold and other precious metals. That's more after the break. Yahoo Finance is Wealth is your guide, your group of advisors, planners, and jargon busters to help you save, build, and grow your money. 
How do I know if I'm saving enough for retirement? How do I know if it's right for me to go on that lavish vacation? Is it finally time to refinance my mortgage? How do I pay less in taxes? We'll get you the answers you need. Wealth, earning it, growing it, and managing it. It's more than tracking just the latest market moves. It's more than your favorite trending tickers. One does not simply build wealth without considering the entire financial landscape. It takes a community, and we've built one for you. Wealth cuts through the noise to help guide your financial decisions so that your money works for you. Wealth on Yahoo Finance premieres March 25th. Watching the price of gold trading near all-time highs, hovering around the peak we saw last week of $2,182 per ounce. Now, that's nearly a 20% rise in a little over just five months since those October 2023 lows. But there's been a divergence in how to play commodities amid persistent inflation. Now, central banks have been purchasing more gold, while ETF investors are looking at rising real interest rates and selling gold. As part of our ETF strategy, brought to you by Invesco QQQ, let's bring in Robert Mintner, Aberdeen Director of ETF Investment Strategy to discuss the smartest ways to invest in the precious metal trade. Thank you for joining me this morning. So first, as we look at what we've seen with gold prices here, and we're looking at that inverse relationship that we typically see with treasuries and gold, how should people be looking at investing via ETF in this space? Sure. So that story really has always been that investors trade gold based off of real interest rates. And so as real interest rates, interest rates minus inflation rise, 
gold would tend to drop in price. So um, that is, in fact, what ETF investors have been doing for the last two years uh, as as real interest rates have risen. Um, they've sold 750 tons across the industry of gold, uh, which is a very, very large amount. Um, and the only reason that gold prices are not lower than they are today, given all that selling, is because there were two very large buyers in the market. One was the collective central banks, which bought 2,000 tons over the last two years. And uh, more recently, um, open interest has uh, spiked higher from hedge fund in investing. Uh, and that's just been recently in the last couple of weeks. So, so those two segments of the market have been buying and ETF investors continue to sell. Um, they would tend to uh, start to buy once we, once we get a Fed funds rate cut actually come through. So, oh, wait, Robert, it, so it sounds like you don't necessarily think that the fundamental support where gold prices have gone, if it weren't for those two big buys that you were talking about, wouldn't be the record that we saw um, last week. Where does it go from here then with the expectation that there could be a rate cut from the Fed come June? Sure. So last three times that the we reached this point of the Fed hiking cycle, which the last hike is already done, we're kind of in the, the pause period of the cycle uh, right before a cut. And whether the cut happens in June or some other month this year, it really doesn't matter much to us. Uh, the point is that the hikes are over and the, the next move is going to be a cut when it when it occurs. Um, last three times that happened was in 2000, 2008, um, 2000, 2006, and um, 2018. And those last three times resulted in a 57%, 235%, and 69% rise in the price of gold. So um, past is not the future. However, that's how all the AI machine learning and, uh, um, uh, you know, trading systems work. So um, we're, we're, that, that has gold on our radar. And so as we look at some of the other things that are on your radar, I mean, you have to wonder if investors are perhaps either overlooking or, or undervaluing gold as, you look, as they perhaps look at some of these, you know, sexier things like they're seeing with NVIDIA and chips and other things. How should people be looking at allocating precious metals in the portfolio and some of the names you like? Sure. So um, commodity cycles tend to run in, in a, a bit longer than the average investor thinks. So we look at, at data since 1870, and the average cycle is about 18 years. So when tend to be good times to increase commodity exposure from a very broad level without getting into all the fundamentals and minor activity, et cetera. And so there's there's really two um, events that can that can warrant increasing commodity exposure. Very low physical inventories. There's not a lot of it around. That's true right now across a lot of the commodity spectrum. And the second thing is, very low or short money manager positioning to commodities. And that's very, very true now also. So with both of those true, it's really interesting to us, and we heard a little bit of it from your prior guests, um, that there's increasing difficulty adding to commodity uh, supplies from, from miners, due to environmental concerns, um, changing taxes, government um, uh, sort of regulation hurdles, et cetera, that are, that are changeable. And in addition, we're seeing a better outlook for the global economy and, and for commodities in particular, it's very exposed to the, to the Chinese economy. So with these, with, in, in this sort of a setup, it, we think uh, commodities warrant a little bit closer attention, particularly industrial, uh, um, industrial exposed commodities and silver. Uh, so, so Robert, let's talk strategy. I mean, how do you put your money to work in the space? Sure. Are so, some ETFs you've got your eye on. Sure. So, with with gold at or near all-time highs and silver trading at a 50% discount to its all-time high, which occurred in, in 2011. I think silver is really interesting. 
about 50% of demand for silver comes from industrial activities. And um, so we like SIVR, which is a silver ETF. Um, we also like BCIM, which is a uh, Bloomberg Industrial Metals um, Commodities Index. It's purely passive, has large weighting to copper, aluminum, zinc, nickel, lead, um, all the things that drive both the energy transition and the industrial economy. So um, we, we like both of those right now. All right, Robert Minter, Aberdeen Director of ETF Investment Strategy. Uh, appreciate you stopping by today. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. All your markets action ahead. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance. It's a jam-packed hour focusing on the biggest movers and shakers on Wall Street. This is market domination, and here, every day is game day. We have one hour left until the market close. It's game time for investors to make their final plays. The clock is ticking, and we've got you covered with our quarter-by-quarter -quarter playbook. We're bringing you in on all the market action with step-by-step -step analysis of our biggest trending tickers. And expert insight into the day's biggest headlines. We'll bring you the closing bell and get you to the finish line. This is Market, market Domination. Domination. Tune in daily from 3 to 4 p.m. Eastern.
This year's tax deadline is right around the corner, but what can you do to start preparing for next year? Yahoo Finance's Kerry Hannon is here to break down how you can manage your retirement accounts in 2024. Good to see you, Kerry. So what do we need to know? Yeah, great to see you as well. Well, yeah, the last thing we want to start thinking about is next April, right? And next tax day. But but you really need to do that. And most people who are taking required minimum distributions from their retirement accounts found out probably in January from their uh, providers, people who the financial services companies who have their retirement accounts, what their required minimum distribution is likely to be. But what you need to do is you realize that how this is calculated is you're looking at you know, what your year in balance was in your retirement accounts. And last year was a pretty darn good year. So that balance is going to be, uh, for most people, a real pop up from how it's been in the past, which will mean a bigger tax bill coming next year, because they take that, the IRS takes that amount of your year end retirement account value and divides it by your life expectancy. And there's a table they have. And so the older you are, the bigger chunk you have to take out. So here's the deal. If you can start now, like take a look uh, maybe you talk to, uh, it's important, you know, just get some help. If you're concerned about this, talk to your tax professional. Usually you can run calculators. AARP has a good one. So does the IRS has has help with this. Fidelity, the big, the big firms have this that can help you figure out your withdrawal amount if you don't already know it. But by all means, take action and see what that's going to be because you can stretch it out over the year when you take those payments. You can automate it so that you don't mess up and miss something and have a penalty. So do that. Um, but it's also a chance to take a look at what are some of the other things you can do with that money. If you're a charitable person, you like to give to nonprofits, you can offset your required minimum distribution with a charitable deduction. And these are called qualified, I'm trying to get it right, qualified, qualified charitable deductions. Talk to your tax professional about this, but you can just so slide that money over to a nonprofit and that um, takes away your uh, withdrawal amount. You might also, this is one that nobody wants to think about, well, why not ramp up how much you take? Why do you have to take the minimum? I talked to Ed Slot, who's a real professional in the, in the IRA world, and he said he tells everyone take more because taxes today aren't, aren't as high as they could be in the future. I mean, uh, 10 years ago, they were higher than they are today. So uh, it, it's a crystal ball kind of thing. But if you're comfortable and you know what your tax burden is going to be right now, it could be higher in the future. Take out more. And the fact of it is, Rochelle, you don't have to spend that money, for gosh sakes. You can invest it. And the market is is not a bad place, as we're seeing today, lots of uh, happening this this year so far. So might be an opportunity to, do, to reinvest that in a, an account that's a non-retirement account. Um, that's another opportunity. So the the final tip is really, you know, take a look and balance things out. You know, take money from your taxable accounts and the ones that have not been, you know, tax has not been paid yet. So it's a matter of figuring out the balance here and what your tax bill is likely to be. But it's important to really get a grip on this because you don't want the year to go sliding by and you haven't really paid attention uh, to what this tax bill is likely to be. And again, uh, anytime you can automate this, you're really going to be much happier at the end of the year. Indeed. No, don't want any nasty surprises at the end of that, uh, at the end of that year. <laughs> Appreciate you as always. Our very own Kerry Hannon. Thanks so much. Thank you. All right, well, let's get your final check of the market as we head into the noon hour. Looking at green across the board, though, still relatively flat as the market's drawing their collective breath and sort of waiting on hold until they hear from Fed Chair Powell at 2 p.m. this afternoon on what we'll hear about um, the press conference there coming out of the rate decision as well. Well, that does it for now. I'm Rochelle Akufo alongside Akiko Fujita. Thanks for watching Yahoo Finance.